be slipping away Let me still exist In another place Running on the corner Of a helicopter plane Flames are getting higher In every Burning down the bridges Of my memory Love may still be alive Somewhere, somewhere Where they're down and only dear A hundred steel towns away Yanking back the handle 
darkness Light it up, light it up I can still feel a touch Of your thin blue jeans Running down the alley I got my eyes all over you, baby Be safe. 
makes his home Where the ocean meets the sky I'll be sailing
been away Let me still exist In another place Running on the corner Of a helicopter plane Flames are getting higher The energy Burning down the bridges Of my memory Love may still be alive Somewhere, somewhere Where they're down and only dear A hundred steel towns away Light it up, light it up, light it up I can still feel a touch Of your thin blue jeans Running down the alley I got my eyes all over you, baby Oh, baby Right. 
the darkness Light it up, light it up, light it up I can still feel a touch Of your thin blue jeans Running down the alley I got my eyes all over you, baby Slot machine 
expression on my face Today what we are doing is, the theme is the old and the new. Some was able to service both the old guys, or the guys who started BBC, and the new guys who just joined BBC. So Kevin represents the old, clearly. Does he look old? <laughs> All right. And then Martin represents the new guys. Hey. hey we're going into a new dispensation tomorrow, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's going to take you through the, the first part of the program, and then I'll take over the second part. Asante. Good morning once again. Um, it's a pleasure being here with all of you as we remember Sam, Sam Kenny. Um, as we begin, I'd just like us to just take a moment of reflection. As, and um, I'd ask you to just, if you don't mind, um, close your eyes. And just think of two things you want to be grateful for Sam's life. Just remember two things that you want to say, thanks, Sam. Gratitude is a powerful, powerful tool in getting through life. So let's just give thanks amidst all the pain for Sam and two ways that he touched you. As we begin this um, service, we're going to do things a little bit unconventional. We have to honor Sam, right? <laughs> and I'm going to start with this. It's an Apache blessing, a Native American blessing. And it reads, May the sun bring you energy every day, bringing light into the darkness of your soul. May the moon softly restore you by light bathing you in the glow of restful sleep and peaceful dreams. May the rain wash away your worries and cleanse the heart that sits in your heart. May the breeze blow new strength into your being and may you believe in the courage of yourself. May you walk gently through the world, keeping your loved one with you always, knowing that you are never parted in the beating of your heart. Before I invite um, Sam Moody to start us off with a eulogy. I'm going to share something last. A poem called When the Giant Trees Fall. When giant trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly, see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words, and said, promised walks never taken. 
great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave, take leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nature, now shrink, wizened. Our minds formed and informed by the radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, after a period of peace blooms, slowly and always, irregularly, spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be, be, and be better, for they existed. We are here to salute a giant tree that has fallen, but we are all the more grateful that they existed. Um, so we're going into a small section of the tribute I like to call Sam Muli before um, I'll just uh, before we begin with the rest of the program. Karibu Sam. Good morning. Uh, this is a eulogy for Samson Kalundu Ken, Bath. Samson Kalundu Ken was born in Nairobi on 24th August 1974 as the third born child to Simon Ken Kianda and Ellen Kanini Kenny. Family. He was the younger brother to Elizabeth Mikali Kenny and Kefa Kianda Kenny, uncle to Michelle Mudeu, and grandfather to Natalie Kamau. Education. He grew up largely in Nairobi and attended Kongoni Primary School in South Sea, Nairobi from 19. 81 to 1988. For his secondary education, he studied at Iway Secondary and Megwani Secondary Schools, where he finished in 1995. After joining BBC, he continuously upgraded his skills and knowledge in the IT and acquiring, by acquiring different certifications relevant to his area of expertise. Career. Upon completion of his studies, he worked briefly at the Hotel Intercontinental before joining BBC in 1998, where he has worked uh, for about 24 years. He has always been an outgoing and adventurous individual who, tried, who has tried out many new things and succeeded especially in the IT field. Thanks, Sam. Um, we're going to have a small video um, looking at the life and times of Sam.
not think. Ah, perfect. <laughs> and it was fat dog. Fat Yeah, pink. <laughs> 24 shades of pink. 
Uh, I personally remember Sam as a light, open personality, certainly fun, uh, informally authoritative, uh, unfailingly polite, perhaps a little bit more authoritative with me and his office here in Nairobi, fair, uh, being patient with my lack of technical awareness, silly questions, uh, his patience uh, shining through. In the past week, we've heard so many insights uh, to Sam's life that have brought uh, a positivity and fruitfulness to so many people's lives, um, a staggering amount in, in the last week. Uh, no doubt we'll hear more and learn more about Sam uh, through this morning as well. Uh, but importantly for me, through these tributes, we kind of naturally ask ourselves how to mark and sustain Sam's uh, legacy as an amazing human being and creative engineer. For my part, I want to ensure that uh, that happens, and I work with all of you to make sure that uh, that becomes a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, during this section, um, session, we'll be hearing a lots of tributes from former colleagues. I mean, current colleagues of of the BBC. And this one, we go over. It feels like being on focus on Africa, man. We go over to London. Hello, um, this is Lillian Lando. She'll introduce herself. Hello, Lillian. Uh, hello, hello. I uh, hope you can hear me. Um, thank you all. Thank you for the fantastic words. I'm honored to be able to celebrate the mystery and the life of um, the family. would have wanted to be with you, but that sounds such a written. Uh, Sam is left far too soon, and his passing has left all who knew him and those who knew of him. In Kenya, on the continent, in the UK, it has left us all impotent and helpless, bereft, and dealing with the pain. And so I'm grateful that Juliet and Rachel are organizing this memorial in his honor. Sam is one of those rare, very rare people that whoever you talk to, wherever they are, they all speak with one piece, united in describing Sam's kindness, his humility, his sense of humor, and his remarkable ability to solve problems, but also his ability to good friend his friends, and we will can remember him in all his facts. We in the BBC are grateful for everything he's done for individually and organizing. And we will create a good and proper way to honor him for years to come and honor his profession to the BBC. So all I have to say, go gently, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Lilian. I'd like to call Mark Tyrrell, who was one of Sam's long-term colleagues and managers. Caribou Mark. Thank you um, very much for inviting me today to speak. Um, it is an honor. And I extend my personal condolences to Sam's family and friends. To be honest with you, I'm not quite sure where to begin. The, the very sudden and unexpected loss of a colleague, and more importantly to me, of a very good friend, is a numbing shock. Sam and I have been friends for some 20 odd years, and he was the very essence of humility and kindness. He was also a very creative, a very tenacious, and a very private person. I looked at the photographs that accompanied the aerial tribute, and this indeed was Sam. The broad smile 
and clearly proud of what he's achieved. And he did achieve much. He was forever pushing the boundaries of what scant funding was available for the Bureau at Longernot and the live broadcasting that he did in those years. When the BBC did allow me to manage a budget, uh, Sam's arguments for funds were at once persuasive and compelling, but delivered in a sort of disarming Sam kind of way. I had breakfast last week with Martin Turner, who used to be in charge of the Bureau here. And Martin can be credited as being the person who first co-opted Sam into the BBC. And what follows now are Martin's words, not mine. And Martin said, Sam once told me he thought he was lucky to work at the BBC. I said, I thought it was the BBC that was lucky. Most people probably know that Sam ended up working at the BBC because the Intercontinental Hotel assigned him to work with the BBC team covering the 1997 election. Martin said, we took over the penthouse restaurant and it didn't take a genius to see that Sam was super smart and super interested. Before the end of the election, he was already helping with a bunch of broadcasting stuff that definitely did not fall within the hotel job description. It also didn't require much imagination to figure out that we, as the BBC, should find a way for the BBC to hire this person. And so he joined first as a runner. Everything Sam achieved from that point was the result of being good, no brilliant, at his job. So it really is the BBC that should feel lucky to have had the privilege of knowing Sam and benefiting from his skills. And one other thing Martin adds, he says, I took him to lunch at the Intercon to mark the 20th anniversary, his 20th anniversary, at the BBC. He was still friends with his former colleagues and he absolutely insisted on paying for lunch. And those were Martin's words. Distance does sadly limit what you can do as friends. You can't just spend ad hoc time together at a moment's notice. And so on the few occasions that Sam was able to get to the UK, we tried to make it count. I'm not sure, though, that on his very first visit to the UK, that he was fully prepared <clears throat> for the onslaught of being met at Heathrow by two of my then very young and very boisterous boys, and then never-ending quick-fire questions between Heathrow and our home in Sussex. If the flight hadn't exhausted him, then that car journey must have finished him off. These visits to the UK sometimes, though, did not go always to plan. Some of you may be aware of Sam's interest in top-end motorcycles and motorcycle racing. It was a few years back, but we did make it to Silverstone for the British round of the MotoGP. But Britain, being Britain, even in the summer, it rained and it rained so hard it led to the cancellation of the race. And yet Sam assured me that just being at Silverstone was worth the effort. I was last here in May and Sam very kindly invited me and Tony to dinner at his home, his new home of which he was justly proud. It was an enjoyable evening of stories past, of reflection, and thoughts for the future. Not that I knew it, 
but this would be the last time that I would be with Sam. It's too easy to dwell on what might have been in times to come. And it's too easy to miss the mourn, the miss and the mo and mourn the missed opportunities. It's the moments shared that are to be remembered and cherished. Sam, my friend, you have left us far too early, but rest peacefully. Thank you, Mark. We now come closer to home and get tributes from the Bureau. We'll start off with uh, Juliet and Jerry, who will be followed by Rachel Akidi. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Juliet and Jerry, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I worked with Sam for more than 10 years. I don't know what words can convey our deepest condolences, uh, but I hope that by our presence and our actions, we have showed you how much we loved Sam, and you will feel comforted knowing that you don't stand alone. The news of Sam's passing was received with shock, disbelief, and indescribable sadness, not just by the team in Kenya, but by co countless colleagues in Africa, the UK, and across the world who had had the chance to know and work with Sam. The term legend is sometimes overused, but not this time. It best describes what Sam had become to us. He was an extraordinarily gifted, largely self-taught engineer, a powerhouse of knowledge and technical brilliance. And he did it all with a unique blend of humor, kindness, and humility that touched all those who worked with him. He contributed to the vast expansion of BBC's operations in Africa in recent years, helping to bring the immediacy of live sound and video from even the most remote locations to audiences everywhere. Sam's talent soon became evident after joining the BBC in 1998, and Mark has already told us how he got to join the BBC. His passion for technology was unique and infectious, even for non-experts. He liked nothing better than describing how he could improve this or that system to make it better, more useful, and more reliant. Supported by Sam's enthusiasm and energy, the small Nairobi Bureau grew in size and importance to become one of Africa's main hubs for the BBC. He kept the infamous apps room, a vast conglomerate of cables, servers, and computers humming along nicely during all manner of crisis. He was so proud of that apps room. I remember telling him once when he insisted on taking me to the room, which you, the people who work at BBC know how cold it is. I told him, I'm sure you'd rather live here than anywhere else in the world. And he said, well, I don't think I can dispute that. Sam's mere presence was a sign that you were in safe hands and I lost count of the number of times I called him with a problem or another. And he said, don't worry, I'll sort you out. All this was taken to a totally new level with the World 2020 expansion and the move to the much more complex bureau at Nine Riverside Drive, the largest office in Africa. Senior project manager Asta Bain, who worked very closely with Sam, said that he made it the best project she had ever worked on, and she will never forget his passion, humor, and generosity. I cannot believe he's gone, she says. Many teams across Africa, and indeed the world, have benefited from Sam's enthusiasm and resourcefulness. He often visited smaller, more isolated bureaus, sorting out problems that no one else seemed to have the answer for. He helped mentor younger engineers, dazzling them with his knowledge while encouraging them to explore and imagine. I'm sure they will continue his rich legacy. Sam would go where big stories happened, often with his colleague, Anthony Mwashegwa, and set up, sometimes only within hours, 
temporary BBC and TV and radio studios so that our teams could shine across all BBC channels. It is humbling to realize how much the world has learned over the years about Africa through Sam's work. The stories and memories that colleagues have shared about Sam in recent days are not by any means limited to his technical gifts. There are countless stories about Sam reassuring someone before a job interview, calling a friend who was sick or had just had an, in an accident, or just raising your spirits after another hard day. Sam's office was where I went to when I was having a hard day. And he always said, come, let's go. Most of you know where we used to go. <laughs> Sam was a selfless colleague and friend, and he always shone so bright. He always had an answer and a joke for every situation. A stroll into his office always turned into an opportunity to catch up, have a laugh, and a chance to sample whatever posh snack or food Sam had on his desk, and he always had something <laughs> to eat on his desk. His generosity was boundless, whether it was sharing food, recipes, a rack of spices, a can of ironing starch to make your clothes crisp and sharp enough for Sam's meticulous standards, advice on the right phone to get, the right laptop, router, TV, watch, shoes, wine, washing detergent, the list was endless. He knew all the best things for every situation. And his disdain for poor quality things was legendary, as well as his dislike for sweet potatoes. Sam's job, in essence, was to connect us with our audiences, but he did much more than that. He helped us connect with each other. For me, the things I will take away from Sam's life. He taught me to always pursue excellence, whether at work or when ironing your clothes, to treat everyone with respect and to be the coolest guy in the room. We will desperately miss him and it's difficult to imagine the office without him. And as Lilian said, we will find enduring ways to celebrate and honor Sam's legacy. We will hold on to the beautiful memories of the Sam that we knew and loved, of all the amazing things he did, and his love for complicated technical drawings, and most of all, of the love that he poured into all of us so generously, and his wonderful sweet smile. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Rachel Akidi. Um, I'm the head of East Africa for the BBC World Service uh, based here in Nairobi. I'm going to talk about Sam, um, the Sam I knew, both as a colleague and as a friend. As Bruce said earlier, Sam's reputation preceded him. I was working in London uh, before I moved here. And every time we needed any technical expertise in any African country, Sam Kenny was the man to go to. As you all know, you know, Africa is a complex continent when it comes to technology. So every time you had an ambitious project, you had to first call Sam and gauge his opinion. Now the thing is, he never ever said anything was impossible. 
he was a creative genius. However ambitious the project was, in whatever remote village you were in, you'd always count on Sam to make it happen. And I think we as journalists don't get to celebrate the people who actually ensure that we get to our audiences. And these are usually the technical teams behind everything we see. And you know, the teams who you know, bring us on air, on TV, on the radio, online. Plus the people who facilitate you know, the journalists behind the scenes to ensure our success. Sam was one of those unsung heroes. He was an eccentric character. And I think being Sam Kenny was a challenge. Sam set very high expectations and standards for himself. But he also carried the expectations that others had set for him. And he had to work very hard to live up to them. I came to Nairobi a few months before we moved uh, to the Riverside Bureau uh, just over four years ago. And my first assignment was to check out the new bureau and familiarize myself with the project in order to you know, plan the migration of the teams from the old bureau in Longonot Place. And on my first day at work, I went to Riverside and I met with Sam. And he, he was with his twin, Anthony, as I usually called them, Anthony Mwashega, and the project man manager, uh, Asta Bain. It was a building site, but you could tell the three of them were in heaven. It appeared like there was nowhere else they would rather have been. They spent long days and nights getting that bureau set up. It was difficult to get them to take time off. I lived around the road in Riverside, just you know, away, uh, a few minutes away from the office. And on some weekends, I'd go down to the cafe. Uh, there's a French cafe uh, uh, near the office. And every time I went, it was almost certain that I would bump into Sam and Anthony in the cafe because he would be at work. And I remember jokingly asking him whether he even had a home or whether he was just living rent free in the BBC Bureau. And, and he just laughed. Sam was a workaholic. He loved his job. And he told me his job was everything to him and he couldn't imagine doing anything else. And I know for sure that when he got ill, the fact that he could not perform to his optimum and the fact that you know, his failing health could not allow him you know, to bury himself in work when he wanted to, as he used to, really tore him apart. Sam did not only love his job, you know, he was excellent at it. And to me, Sam embodied excellence. He was not a friend of mediocrity. He wanted everything to be of high quality. He wanted it to be excellent. If he needed to do something, it had to be the best. And if he wanted to buy something, it had to be the best. And I think this was reflected in everything that he touched. In his work, you know, his fancy gourmet cooking, his taste for impeccable quality, and his relationships with everyone he connected with. I remember we visited him a few days after he had moved into his new house, and Brenda, his manager, told him he was like a Luo man. And he laughed out so loud. And you know, the joke, <laughs> I, I, I didn't get the joke until he explained uh, that Luo's like nice and expensive things. And I think this is one thing I will personally take as a life lesson uh, from Sam. And I don't mean the expensive things uh, <laughs> because I can't afford them, but the aspiration to be excellent no matter what. We spoke a lot, especially during lockdown. And sometimes he'd call me really late in the night and would speak, sometimes for hours. And I took his calls, you know, however late, because I'd made a commitment to him to call me whenever he needed to talk, whenever he needed someone to talk to. He always sent me recommendations of where and how to import stuff from Europe and the US. And he knew the stores and warehouses 
that sold all this stuff here in Nairobi, and on what days the containers arrived in Mombasa, where how, how they were cleared by customs, and when they were off offloaded, and you know what time to get to the store in order to get the best stuff uh, before everybody else got wind of it. And I teased him about his extreme OCD when he told me he actually imported all his detergents as well. And I think he wasn't lying, because when he took us on a tour of his house, he had a whole stash of them, and you'd think it was for cleaning you know, a 100-room hotel or something. I think everyone seems to have known Sam was a great cook uh, before I did. So when he used to send me pictures of his food, I used to think he had just nicked them off internet uh, or Instagram. And you know, when we went to his house for lunch, we sat in his kitchen, and we watched him cook you know, from scratch. And he cooked you know, the most amazing food. And I told him, you know, I finally believed he was the real owner of the photos that he was sharing. I spent, you know, the last three or four months uh, tucked away in meeting rooms, and he'd always sneak in to the office. This is after we'd just gone back after COVID in May, and give me a hug. And he always greeted me with a hug. So even if I was on a Zoom call, he would knock at the door, and he would signal, say, turn off the camera. <laughs> And he just gives me a hug, doesn't have to say anything, and, and off he goes. And a few days before he died, he told me, I think you're due for another meal in my house. And I said, sure, when can we do it? And he said, well, let's first get the Supreme Court Manenos out of the way, as he put it. Unfortunately, we shall never have that meal. I just pray for his soul. I might never know how much he fought. But I know he fought hard. He had dreams, dreams for the future. He was quite open, and he spoke to several people. And I believe he did this because he was desperate to get better. I just pray that God gives him rest. I pray for peace and comfort for his loved ones, especially his family, for his friends and his colleagues. I want to remember Sam, you know, as a person who loved life and a person who loved people. And he believed in maximizing his God-given talent and potential. But above all, I want to remember Sam simply as a wonderful human being. Since he died, I've received several messages from his former colleagues and friends around the world. And I just want to share, before I go, uh, just a couple that stood out. And this one is from Peter Burden, who used to be the Africa Bureau editor here in Nairobi and in Johannesburg. And he worked with Sam uh, for many years. He said, thinking of you and everyone in Nairobi at this terrible time, I can't take the news about Sam, but he was one of the best people. I remember that when the then director of BBC News, Helen Bowden, met him, she was so impressed that she doubled his salary on the spot. And I don't think that's ever happened in the BBC before or since. I also want to read a tribute from a colleague that Sam used to call simply Muse. This colleague has asked me not to mention his name, but you'll probably figure out who he is. And here it goes. The outpouring of grief is a strong testament to what Sam meant to each one of us. For more than 15 years, we knew each other, and Sam never called me by my name. He simply called me Muse. Losing Sam is extremely painful, and that pain is piercing like a hot arrow through the heart. The sorrow is draining. The emptiness is all-consuming. Last Saturday, I had the privilege of speaking with Sam's mother, Mama Helen, his sister Elizabeth, and his brother Kefa. We all shared the adorable track record of Sam's fine and impactful work. We all spoke about how special and loving Sam was. Certainly, Sam Kenny has left the world far much better than he found it. As we mourn together, let us also extend a hand of comfort and compassion to one another. For by so doing, we'll overcome the heavy and engulfing cloud of sadness and summon memories of the goodness for which we shall always remember some. That goodness is there for all of us to see, to touch, to experience, and to celebrate. 
Sam's name looms large across the BBC's footprint in Africa. Abuja, Dakar, Dar es Salaam, Johannesburg, Kampala, Kinshasa, Nairobi, Lagos. Who can forget the 15-hour Swahili BBC broadcast for 10 days during Tanzania's 2010 elections? All this was done via a tiny gadget called the Comrex, and Tanzania's security personnel visited the Bureau in Dar es Salaam hoping and demanding to see massive satellite dishes that were powering BBC's Swahili radio station, as they put it. And they were shocked to find that there were no dishes. Some dazzled them with the little comrex, and they left the team in peace and just wished them luck. In 2017, Sam gave three short, sharp, swift answers that would help kickstart the BBC's expansion in Africa. We were faced with tough questions like, the continent doesn't have enough broadband to sustain video production and transmission. Uh, how is it even possible? It takes more than two hours to send a 30-minute clip, so how long will it take for a 15-minute program? Some doubters were adamant that the infrastructure and capacity for TV production in Africa is weak, and therefore, such an investment was impossible. But Sam knew better. He saw the opportunities and focused on the possibilities that saw the project succeed. We stand on the shoulders of a genius whose achievements and attainments saw the skies, Sam Kenny. In mourning and in celebration, it's not what about Sam was. It will forever be who Sam is in our hearts. May those memories endure, and may the Lord bless his soul, and may he rest in eternal peace. From Musee. Thank you very much, Rachel, for that. Um, still sticking with the Bureau, I'd like to call over Sharon Wanga, who is reading a tribute on behalf of Brenda Namidi. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sharon, like you said. I will be reading the tribute on behalf of Brenda Namidi. Um, dearest Sam, more than a colleague, a loving friend, you never compromised. You went through life with a smile. A witty comment here and there, always leaving people wanting more. And uh, those in the Bureau can attest to that. Anything he might say, you might want to, you know, PG it. <laughs> um, you loved the finer things in life. And it was a running joke within the IB team that um, he should have been born a little man and he always responded by saying he has Luo friends. So <laughs> note to self, have Luo friends. Um, he, he was all, you always were willing to share your love for food and experiences. You once said to me, I don't know how to say thank you, yet your actions spoke for you. I've never met such a generous person. I'll miss the gifts from your travels I'll miss the gifts from your travels. You encouraged me through tough t moments in my career, always taking time off your very busy schedule to attend to my needs, never impatient. For that, I will always be grateful. You allowed me to share the special moments in your life. I feel privileged to have known you. Dear Sam, go well, my friend, till we meet again. We love you and we miss you. Thank you. We now, mo we now move to the tech part of this section. Um, I'll start calling Maggie, who's gonna represent one of the, I think the production team. Um, and she'll be followed by Martin Chege. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm reading on behalf of a team of 16 people, um, the production team. Most of us met Sam Kenny on the 19th of February 2018 when we all reported for work at Riverside. By the time we were all done introducing ourselves, he'd already mastered our names and from there our work relationship was morphed. To some of us in the team, he was a fan day babe, Kenny. To me, he was Samsung, a name he really didn't fancy because he said it lacked something. He was very strict. He was strict to a fault when it came to work and any damaged equipment wouldn't be replaced without him finding out what exactly happened. 
he'd actually tease Martin and I every time he peeped into a little corner at the back of the studio by asking us, my managers, but I'm not going to talk back. And now I'll read some of the tributes from my team members. This is from Solomon Kihara. Sam, you are the technical glue to our production operations, firm, generous, and had a sense of humor. I thank God for giving me an opportunity to work with you, Kwaheri. From Herbert Masua, Sam was a man of the people, a trusted technical guru who was always ready to serve. I will miss his wit, Safiri Salama. From David Kinyanjui, Sam, generously all-rounded person, great at combining human seriousness and also brilliant at his job. Great chief, engineer, rest well. From Marine Jockey, Sam, very good-hearted and generous. He made sure my desk was fully equipped and that I was happy. He was a great friend. We shared a lot of personal issues and I will dearly miss him. From Marianne, Awesome, a vast a thousand whys, but all questions and fears have been answered with silence. You are a good man full of humor. You gave me so many fancy things for my makeup room and always thought I was witty. Unfortunately, now I have to remember you for longer than I've known you. Back to the stars, hopefully, one day we'll meet you there. And for me, some, some of us wore your signature look today, an unbuttoned shirt and a t-shirt and sneakers, but you can see it for you to laugh and actually cast us out like you did in September of 2019 when we did this for the first time. You are brilliant. You are selfless. I will miss you terribly. Home is where we, home is where the tired go to sleep. Home is where the stars will always lead us. Now we all have a star up there. You fought hard. Now rest Samsung. Rest in peace, Kenny. <laughs> all right. Hello, everyone. I've been given the privilege to to read the hey it's hot in here. Wait, 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 wait. To read the the eulogy and the tribute for the engineering team. I don't know why they chose me, but hey, I'm here, eh? All right. Look at the person who's sitting next to you and tell him, Sasa. Just do it for me. The other person sitting next to you, tell them Sasa. All right. Sasa was, was Sam's greeting whenever we met and walked down to the engineering office. Sam always walked fast, eyes on his steps straight to the office. He would drop his bag first, then walk out. He rarely used the lift. Each day we was different when it came to work, and Sam would always be working on something. Sam had a broad and deep knowledge in his life. He would explain in details most of the things from the invention and the evolution of most, uh, to the evolution of most of the things, be it a screwdriver, systems, or why we should vacuum, seal our food. Wow. His mastery of things was extraordinary to us. Uh, he was an institution. He knew the BBC systems like the back of his hand. And, and, we, and when things seemed not to work, he would take a break. If the challenge persisted, he would pick his bag and leave, only to sort out the issue the subsequent day. He had a replica of office desk in his residence. And uh, we noted this when we visited him in May. That's the engineering team. To him, work was like the air we breathe. He simply couldn't do without it. Whenever Sam was called, he always picked up, especially when, he, when the call came from the engineers. And just in case he missed it, he would call back in good time. Sam was always ready with solutions. 
we once had a surprise birthday party. Uh, we all knew he would not be ready for it. The IB team took cover in the apps room and monitored Sam via the CCTV as he walked towards the engineering office. As he approached the office, we came out of the apps room and forced him insi inside the engineering office just next to the apps room, and we sang happy birthday to him. Sam appreciated the moment. Our main last encounter with Sam was at the rooftop of Serena. This was the setup of our studio and gallery during the just concluded Kenyan, Kenya elections. We had good moments. He explained to us the safety regulation as per the BBC. He was impressed with the setup and ensured we had everything we needed technically. We played him his favorite mix of soul classic, One of the Days, and you could see his eyes light up. Sam liked a good stuff uh, from the way he dressed, the food he ate, the music he listened to, and the shirts he wore. He loved music. He made sure that everyone close to him would listen to his favorite songs over and over and over. So classics ruled his airwaves. He also loved a good artwork. We noted this when we visited him. He had a very unique, um, he had very unique wall paintings and explained where he got some of his pieces. Some treated us like his own siblings. In many occasions, we had lunch together. All at his cost, he was very generous and warm. Some's last moments were very sad. The events, the events were subsequential. Everyone close to him could see things we were, were not well. We did what we could, and that was our best. We believe that where Sam has gone, there is peace, eternal peace. He will always be in our hearts. That's the message from the engineering team. I want to make um, just a note and an appreciation to one, one guy who I think Rachel has called him his twin. For me, I used to call them the three musketeers in the office. And one, one specific guy is Anthony. If you could just kindly just put your hands together for Anthony in appreciation. He has worked with this guy very close. And that's a good thing. All right. Kindly, let's watch. Um, Let's watch what the colleagues sent, and that will be a great blessing. Let's look at the screens.
Yeah. I'll start by welcoming you all here, especially Sam's family and friends and our BBC colleagues. Karibuni sana. Um, that means welcome. Um, to the family, I want to start by extending our deepest condolences and praying for God's comfort for you. It's been a hard time um, this past one week since I'm passed. And I have been like most of us here, um, taking time to, first of all, just um, struggling to deal with the news that Sam is no more, and then taking the time to think about what he meant for the BBC um, and what he meant to those of us who are here beyond just being a colleague and I want to say a few words. Um, firstly, I, my relationship with Sam started mostly from dealing with work issues. Um, I look after the BBC teams that work from this office, and as Bruce said, this is um, one of the oldest BBC overseas offices. It's been here from the 1950s. So technology falls apart. A lot of things here are from, from way back before most of us were, were born. And so we'll, we'll be talking with some about what needs to be done in terms of the technological infrastructure here and any other support we needed with that. But then over time, that relationship evolved to a point where we'll talk about personal and social issues. And um, I do remember one of the, the two um, last significant moments that I had with Sam. One was in May, and we had gone for effort um, with a few colleagues who are here. And we were just, we had taken a break from the training, this hostel environment training, and we were talking about things generally in life. And he was talking to me about how happy and proud he was um, of his house in Siokimau. And he was telling me, you know, you keep on worrying about um, the hustle and bustle of Nairobi, but if you move out a little bit, it's more enjoyable, it's quieter, it's spacious. You can, and then um, a few weeks later, towards the end of, um, of June, we met again here. Um, Razvan had come to visit um, and a few other colleagues were around and we were walking here with Razvan and, and Brenda, just looking at the facilities here, all the work that had been done by Sam and other colleagues so who support operations to here. Um, and then we stood out here and we were talking for a moment um, and I'd known for a while since COVID started, I was going through a hard time. So just asking him as a friend, as, as a guy, how are you doing? Um, how are things going? And he said um, the worst was behind him and he was hopeful um, that things, had, were, you know, things were getting better and that he would be well. And we were talking about him just creating time to get out here. Colleagues who work from the office in Riverside know how, you know, how we keep on having this job. When I come into Riverside, I say, it's, it's all in one building. There's no space for me to walk around and stuff. And I was telling him, come out here, there's fresh air and stuff. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to make time to, you know, come out and, and hang out a bit more after the elections are done. But sadly, that did not come to pass. Um, as most of you would know, um, Sam, he was meticulous in everything that he did. I, my personal um, experience of working with him was he had this silent motto. When you went to him with something, he had this unspoken, you know, philosophy that he lived at, which was, I would simply put it like, um, like this. He, he would say, I'll do you one better. And what do I mean by that? You'll go, you'll go to him with a problem, and he will not only solve it, but he'll make sure he, he improves your whole setup. And I have two experiences um, of that um, that um, come to mind more prominently. One was around um, in, at the beginning of lockdown in June, July of, 2020 and we suddenly had everyone working from home and we didn't have enough people who had BBC computers working from home and at that point we used to have um, an IT engineer who used to be in this office here he had been around for over 30 years but he was about to retire so he had gone ahead and gotten three um, laptops that we needed to put a BBC build on and um, we took them to Sam and said, Sam, we have these three laptops. We need them to have a BBC visa colleagues and work with them from home. And he looked at them, checked a few things, and came back and said, Sam, these are rubbish. We can't do anything with them. 
And um, of course, it was it was a tough time. People were working from home and struggling. So they, their first instinct is to feel inconvenienced. But then he was like, don't, don't worry. I'll show you what we'll do. So it was like, this need to go back. We need to order the right uh, uh, laptops that can take the, BBC, the specs of the BBC build. And he went ahead and did that and built them. And then he was calling me very excited, telling me, the build has gone perfectly. These ones will serve you much, much better than the three rubbish ones that you guys had gotten. And we laughed about it, of course, and we were able to dispatch them to colleagues, and, and, and they worked great. And, and you know, I, I, sat, I sat back looking at that, and I was like, that's one of the things I remember about his meticulous approach to things, one, but also how he not only fixed your problem, but he made, he made sure that, you know, he did something better or he went beyond what he needed. We had another conversation um, with him and Tony, um, that's Anthony, I think, for most people. Um, I had a similar experience with the two of them to what Rachel was saying and others about. I looked at them as work twins. If I went into the office in Riverside, they would be there together. If they are coming around here most of the time, they would, you know, they would be in the company of each other. And we were having a problem with um, the Wi-Fi connection here. It kept on tripping. Um, and when I spoke to the two of them and some said, um, what are you guys, that's, I told him you just have a normal Wi-Fi the way you'll have at home. It's like a BBC office should not operate like that. This is not good. So he said, give me a few days and we will see what to do. And he went ahead to fix um, the problem and he set us up on um, the corporate Wi-Fi and they were saying, this, this is the way a BBC office should run. And since then, even today, colleagues have been coming in, you haven't been here before and you've had access to Wi-Fi. It's, it's so much better. It's very superior to what we had before. And again, it's a testament to um, Sam's attention to detail and just going over and beyond what um, we all needed as colleagues. Um, a lot has been said about Sam and what he meant. And I would say for us in our own special way, this office where we are holding the memorial bears the handprint of, of Sam's work here. Um, until we were talking about it with Tony again, one of the musings that um, just happened when you, you know, catching up with colleagues, also trying to process what has happened, that time is no more. And we were talking about the work that went into transforming this place um, in terms of the technology that we use. Sometime back in 2017, we had a major restructure of BBC monitoring, and we were similarly affected by that, just changing the skill set. Um, the digital tools, the equipment that we use, and even doing a revamp of the office, and, and Sam was quite heavily involved in that. And one of the biggest things that bear um, testimony to his legacy with the BBC are these white satellite dishes that you see behind you, that just down here, they're they are smaller compared to the older ones in the back. Those ones were new, but they also allowed us to do so much more, like now we have access to over 100, you know, 104 TV channels here, and dozens of radio stations. And because um, of the work that Sam was doing, working with a contractor who came in from South Africa to make sure that they were set up and everything was working great, we now have an operation that is light years ahead of where we were um, three, four years ago. Uh, we have te technology that allows us to you know, do things that can be sitting here and looking at things happening in Mali and other far-flung parts of the continent. And that's all part of the work that Sam has done here. And we, we are forever grateful for that. Um, like many of us present here, I have wrestled with, you know, regrets, what ifs, um, since uh, we had news that Sam was no more. And I've thought about it. And, you know, hindsight is brutal, but it's also part of life. It's um, this thing that we do, it's a process when you're grieving, when you're soul searching, when you're trying to get acceptance. But then I thought about it. Um, in light of what has happened, what is this thing that I want to do differently in, in memory or to honor Sam? He was generous and he was kind with all of us. And I thought to honor his memory, it would be great for all of us and I implore all of us this, this morning or early afternoon that you extend grace to other people, yeah? that you be kind the way Sam was kind. But above all, make time for yourself. Be kind to yourself. And if you can do that, um, I feel like it's one small step in, you know, honoring the members who are most all of us. Thank you. Carol Karubia, please.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Karubia, and Sam Kenny was not just a colleague to me, but a very good friend. Let me first by, start by offering my sincere condolences to the family, Poleni Sana, and to the BBC family. I have a short tribute uh, for Sam Kenny. Often I called him Kalundu, and those nearby would wonder whether that was his real name or a nickname. And this was because not so many people knew that his other name was Kalundu. And he used to get very mad when people laughed uh, when I called him Kalundu. And he'd say, Nini Baya, that's my name. Hmm? And yes, Kalundu was his real name. And that's how deep, at least I felt I knew Sam Kenny. We met many years ago at Longonot Place, uh, BBC former home in Nairobi. He was a Mr. Fix-It for us. He did everything because he was the only technician we had. He was the only studio manager. He was the only IT person. Just name it and we'd sort it out for you. It's different now. We have a whole team of technicians. Then it was just some candy for us. Those who knew him well know that he was a man with a big heart, humorous and very cheeky and could be annoying at times. <laughs> he had a small office uh, before Anthony, Ken Mongai, uh, Jeff, Sauke, Hassan Lali joined him. He had a small corner office at Longodot Place. And that was our escape when you wanted to have a good laugh with someone who would not judge you, or sometimes when you just wanted to have a quiet time, you tell him, ah, Sam Toka, wachani kayapa kidogo. He was also very hardworking, resourceful, and dedicated to his work. There is no day you would call Sam with a technical issue and he failed to sort you out. It didn't matter what time of the day you called. Every time I phoned him, the first thing he would say, Karo, sasa watu wako wamefanya nini tena? Ni Dar es Salaam au Nairobi? And trust me, being on air every morning and every evening. He received many such calls from us, and he would never complain, even calling at odd hours at 5 a.m. in the morning before we go on air, or later, late at night. But he'd find a way to resolve our issues. His work was more than a job for him, but a passion. It was very hurting uh, for me when I learned that he was unwell. It was sad to see my friends struggling. And we spoke a lot in the past one year, and mostly about his treatment. And we didn't, and when we didn't, I checked with Anthony to find out how our friend was doing. I knew he was really looking forward to get well. You could see it in his eyes whenever he added a bit of weight. He would be so excited, and I too on his behalf. The other day we remembered how on his last days he enjoyed giving colleagues big hugs. And I knew this was, if I knew this was our last hug, I would, I would have hugged him much longer. I remember telling him, talk up, Sam, eh? Stuck back in a colony. I was, I, was, I was away on leave on his last week but Sam was still in our minds. He was also a friend to my family. And on Thursday, uh, he kept on looking for Noel. And I remember telling Noel, please check on Sam. The last time I saw him, he was not looking so good. And they spoke, and they spoke, and they agreed to speak again on Monday. But that was not to be. I will miss you, Kalundu. Rest well, my friend. I have a short tribute uh, from Lulu Sanga. Uh, that's our editor in Dar es Salaam. Sam also looked af after their technical bit. So it's mixed Swahili and English. That's Lulu for you. Nimemfahamu Sam tangu mwaka wa elfu mbili na kuminanane. While I was pushing to get my camera kit. From there he became my go-to person. A very positive human. Leo namshukuru Mungu kwa ajili ya Sam sababu alimtumia Sam 
kunipush katika sehemu moja yeye ndio mtu wa kwanza kunipa fursa ya kuingia kwenye boards za BBC nilifurahi sana nikamwambia Sam are you sure akasema 100% na akanionya don't ever doubt your potential kwa kweli namtakia heri Sam na namshukuru Mungu kwa ajili ya maisha ya Sam asanteni Let's have Ken Mungai and then Irene Kaindi. Good morning. It's my honor to speak about Sam. I'm sad about talking about Sam, Sam the late. I worked with Sam for a long time. I'm struggling to find words enough to describe him. He was a colleague and a friend and a brother to many of us. We shall miss him. The first time I met Sam was when he was boarding me to be his assistant. He was interviewing me. And I remember he asked me a question. He asked me, Ken, if we gave you a scenario and you went to Somalia and you had American uh, soldiers with you and you had this piece of kit then you realize the cable has been cut. What do you do? I told him, Sam, I'll talk to the Americans and they will give me the tools. I told him, Ken, no, if they don't want to talk to you, what do you do? And I told him, Sam, I'll fix it with my teeth. He was impressed and I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> Sam was an achiever. Impossible was possible for him. He saw possibility where many would give up. He would take his time and analyze and come up with a solution. For many years and days and nights, Sam gave all his energies to the BBC across Africa. He was a technology backbone for the BBC. When I joined him, he encouraged me and trained me and nurtured me. We achieved so, so much. Soon we were three when Anthony joined us. But as time went by, many others have joined, and now we have a talented pool of engineers, thanks to Sam. Although I wish I was talking at his retirement party instead of his memorial, Sam and I spoke so many things about life. He wanted to start a restaurant when he retired. We all know that life isn't fair sometimes. It's not fair that Sam has gone from his family and colleagues. The presence of Sam in the office will no longer be there things will not be the same. He had an aura of strength. And I remember in one of the walls he had printed the lyrics of the song, Sleeping Child by Michael Lance. Those words will always remind me of Sam. The words were, Oh my sleeping child, the world's so wild, but you build your own paradise. That's the reason I'll cover you, sleeping child. Sam has finally slept. May he sleep peacefully. This is difficult for me. I want to convey my condolences to Sam's family and to us, his friends. We grew up together with Sam. Of course, he was behind me. We went to Kongoni Primary together, and he was in highway with my brothers. Many of you know that I don't talk in front of large groups but I talk a lot in small groups. Some epitomize the best of people, of all of us. When I went to him with an issue, some not only tech related, he would sort me out. And where he wasn't able to handle the issue himself, he would point me out in the right direction. I had a lot of tech issues from accessing the finance system, to disappearing finance functionalities, which even Sam couldn't understand. But he always took up the challenges I threw his way. Sometimes we would sit up to late at night 
as we were troubleshooting with uh, London and uh, with Atos. And he would sort me out and I would get on with my work. Sam was consistent. He would tell you off but still helped you. Actually, he would give you all his all. Sam was like gold to us. He never changed no matter what was going on. For me, I echo a lot of things that people have said, and that truly was some. We all had a different relationship, interaction with him. I honestly felt I was there for him in the best way I could, considering as I was an outsider, not understanding the challenges he was going through. Go well, Sam. You have left me with very fond memories, and this is how I choose to remember you. May perpetual light shine upon you. All right. Kindly, let's watch the third uh, video. Uh, eyes on the screens, please. Sam was there in the background supporting his colleagues through good times and bad times. And I'm probably not the only one who feels that Sam is still there working away to make sure that we are all okay. Sam was an extraordinary engineer. He was gifted, he was passionate, and his brilliance saved the day so many times. But I think like many others, I will remember him most for his warmth, his charm, his generosity. Everyone who knew him was touched by that. And I think that everything he did on the technical side was just another expression of his humanity. We have lost someone who was truly unique. So on behalf of all my colleagues in international operations from across the world, I would like to say thank you, Sam. Farewell. We will never forget you. We did not start on uh, right note when I joined the BBC in 2018. I had copied some movies into my computer and he thought that I had been using the office internet to download them. Um, but we resolved that and after that we became good friends and we would speak along the corridors. He would be calling me, Where mano? Motongoi, when they are? To mean that, how are you, chief? And um, I got to know the intensity of his job when I uh, went to Johannesburg, South Africa in 2019 to cover the election there. And he and Anthony made our work so easy. They provided all the support we needed and it was a, such a seamless production. We felt like we were just working from Nairobi. Uh, we would often also um, joke about uh, posting on social media and some said he was very particular about saying that he was not in um on the internet apart from an article i think written around 2000 on the bbc and uh some may not have had a prominent 
digital footprint on social media or on the internet, but he left a footprint in our hearts and in my heart. Komanesa Mutongo. I'm honored to announce this person because so they take to us goodbye. back to when we were at Long or Not. And that's when I met them. Ruth Nesoba, if you're here, if you would please come forth. And as Ruth comes forward, I just want to tell you, you guys are talking about the brilliance of moving to Nine West. But that brilliance for us started at Long on Kijabe Street, you know, at the fifth floor of Long or Not Place, when we were still using sat phones. For those who remember sat phones, and big guns, this was just, for us, was everything. And when you saw Sam with a big gun, it was a big story. And he was the only one for a very long time who could deal with the big gun. And there was also smoking in the stairwell within the building. You know, at first they used to smoke at the front with Pat. You know, when you walk into the bureau, you just have to look left, you'd find Sam and Pat there. That was where you'd have his kikau. They would hold fort there. And then they were caught. <laughs> and then they moved to the back, to the other stairwell. <sighs> we used to do our lives from the rooftop, and he used to master that. And then I think for me, was the brilliance was when he moved the whole bureau into flats. It was the Suswa side of Long or Not Place, where he crammed us into flats. Mary had Mary and Moses had just joined, and Mary was Mary's posh, you know. Uh, and Sam used to make fun of her. This chick has come from advertising <laughs> to work at the BBC to be put in a flat. <laughs> but that flat worked. Stores were made into, you know, you know, viewing points, you know, and he made it possible. And we and we managed. BBC monitoring joined us and they were on the second floor or something, you know. And as this refurbishment was happening, him and Anto and Ken were fixing the fifth floor to what it was, where we, we all started getting our own personal computers and not sharing stuff, where we started having self-op rooms to link us up to London without having to carry sat phones or the big and app to the roof. But it was an honor to work for me. What was the greatest story along with Sam was the 2007-2008 election. And we worked. Sorte. We worked really hard. And such was the brilliance of Sam. At the fifth floor, it was fully kitted. Sam took care of everything. There was the mural that he and, he and Mary used to fight over in what pictures to have. You know, the phones. You know, the server room. And even the type of furniture that we were having in the dining area. That was our boy. That was Sam. That was our NZ. Karibu. Thank you so much, Kevin, for the great introduction. What a time and what a life we had. Longonot Place, I think for me, was the epitome of journalism. And it's because of Sam that we did it. You said it, you know, the Marans big guns, the sad phones. There's a time we went with him to Mombasa and he was trying to explain to us why sometimes sad phones don't work so well. It's because of the ocean, he would say sometimes, and then he would laugh. Sam introduced us to a life we'd never known. My love of rock music is because of Sam. With Anthony there, we'd dance to it in the night shifts that we had. Over the weekends when we were on duty with the late Anne Waidera, I smoked my first cigarette because of Sam. That was the first and the last because I choked on it. And then Anne was joking and telling me, you know what, the, the cigarette that chokes you will bring you lung cancer. And we would joke a lot. Anne rests in peace and so does Sam. I hope they are making a happy orchestra up there in heaven. We miss all of you. I stand here on behalf of my colleagues on the East Africa Deployments team, some of them who grew through the hands of Sam. Ken Mungai, who spoke before me, joined as a studio manager and an assistant to Sam. 
and some can myself salim kikeke susan mungi worked on the way i'm kind of bbc it's the year that i joined the bbc that's 2006 that the bbc took a great gamble of moving Amukana BBC to Nairobi. And some made the BBC believe that this program would survive. And it has 16 years later. His technical genius, the brains, everything calmed us then. And we went on air. I was a launch producer. Sam Ongai there was a SM. And Sam did his magic on the, you know, whatever, I don't know what to call them. They're there, you know? And we went on air and we have up to now. I have been on elections one after the other with some to Tanzania in that year when Solomon talked about, you know, 20, was it 2010, 2015? And he would convert a small corridor into a studio and we would go on air on TV and radio. You've seen pictures where we were seated on a rooftop that was overlooking the harbor in Dar es Salaam. And we went live on that, and Sam was on the camera. So he was an all-rounder, Mr. Fix-It, he did everything. We have so much appreciation for Sam because we are who we are because of him. When I left the KBC, it was a national broadcaster to join the BBC, I had never seen uh, audio being recorded on computer. We were doing the reel-to-reels. We were splicing tapes. We were doing all that. Sam held my hand and you know, I took extra lessons with him over the weekend to learn how to record sound on digital. And here I am, standing here. And so I would like to say, Sam, we celebrate your friendship. We celebrate your genius today. We, the editorial team, are the largest or the greatest beneficiaries of your generosity, of your talented brains, and of your hands. We held hope when we saw that you're sick and we kept praying that you're going to bounce back because you are our strength, Sam. When we never believed that we would do it, you say, yeah, come on, we're going to do it. And so we prayed for you and we hope that you're also going to bounce back and win your battle. But that was not to be. It's impossible to summarize the 16 years that I have shared with you and worked with you since those years in these few minutes. Sam, I think we need a better occasion maybe Kevin, you should plan it, where we'll play rock the whole night and remember you some. So I've known you since that year in 2006, and um, you were insightful in all matters, technical, in everything that had to do with electronics. And you always had solutions to any challenges we had, and you would speak to us gently, take us through every concerns that we had. You never feared to take my calls when an equipment had failed to, um, to work. I have sent you on endless trips at short notice to Kampala, for instance, to set up a um, studio for patients during the lockdown, to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, to set up a studio, and you would willingly take it up. You took up calls in the dead of the night when we were asked to come up live, when there was a breaking news. When I needed equipment, Sam, you're always ready to deliver. And you'd ask, do I send a taxi? And you'd do it yourself, Sam. I didn't need to tell you. Sometimes you'd even remind me when elections were coming up. This Kenya election 2022, Sam started planning last year. And he drew the maps. He sent me the pictures. He sent me skylines in Nairobi and said, oh, intercontinental, where we always used to go for our lives has now closed down. Where are we going to go to? We were worried. Sam said, hey, wait a minute, I have an answer, let's go to Serena. And he checked out Serena, but there were challenges, you know, the expressway was coming up, so there was that big brick that was going to block the view. But Sam said he knows what he's going to do. So you see, he had solutions to every problem that we had. And we thank you for that, Sam. Um, I stand here today saying that, Sam, you never stopped giving us hope. I pray that where you're going to, Sam, you're going to dance and enjoy. Keep flying and soaring high, Sam. You always had open spaces for us. You allowed us into your space and you shared a lot with us. We pray that we would have given you much support, but we didn't see this coming. So Sam, what I would just like to say, you drew all this support that you gave us, all these great wise words that you gave us because of the fantastic life experiences that you had and you shared your golden heart with us. And because of that, I would like to say, what a man.
May your memory be a blessing to us. And to Mama Helen, to Sam's sister Elizabeth, and to Sam's brother Kefa, Sam loved you. Our condolences. And we love you back. And we'll be there. We'll stand in the gap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Asante Ness. I'd like to call Shiro to come forward, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, before I begin, I just want to give my heartfelt condolences to Sam's family, Poleni Sana. Now, in the last one week since we lost Sam, I've seen the reaction to his passing. Pain, certainly pain. But the foremost emotion I've witnessed is shock. This is because for so many of us, Sam was supposed to be as timeless as the pillars that hold up the office building. You see, when someone's job is to fix things that no one else can, we begin to see him as larger than life. Well, at least that's how I saw him. My first encounter with Sam Kenny was right after we finished EBJ1 when I just joined the BBC. We were settling into a routine at work and there was something wrong with my machine, so I was told who could help. Ask Sam Kenny. That was a sentence that I would come to hear so many times over the next few years. The engineering office is literally mere steps from where our team sits. As a result, I'd go in to talk to Sam and the rest of the team, you know, the three musketeers, Sam, Anto, and Faith, even when all was well with my devices. And even when I did need his help, the conversation would inevitably turn to other things. I realized that Sam had a treasure trove of goodies hidden in there because he traveled so much and so he'd bring back all kinds of things. So I'd go in with an issue with my phone and leave with chocolate. Or I'd have a question about something else and leave after an impromptu therapy session. Anyone who entered Sam's office can attest to the fact that you'd go in with a technical issue and ended up talking about something else and he'd always make you feel better. It got to the point where whenever he saw me in his office, he'd be like, Hey, Shiro, if I stop bringing chocolates, would I ever see you again? I said, no, I'm using you, Sam. I'm using you for the chocolates. Come to think of it, he made excellent food. Something as simple as a pancake, he did well. He was such a great cook and he has such an appreciation for good food. In fact, the first time he ever hugged me was a few weeks after I joined the BBC. We were talking about food, as apparently I always am, and I told him I like my steak medium rare. He was so excited. He said, thank God you're not like other Kenyans who kill their meat twice. <laughs> By the way, if you told Sam you liked your meat well done, I think he would slap you across the face. So when we returned to the office this May, Sam was different. He just wanted to talk more, interact more, just wanted that human contact. And for someone who wasn't previously that touchy-feely, he would give me a hug every time we happened upon each other in the office. Of course, the hug would be followed by a small insult. Okay, not small, some of those things he said, uh, this is a family gathering, so <laughs> I cannot say it. It was almost like being bullied by a much-loved older brother. And I think about those hugs in the last few weeks of his life, I asked myself if he was saying goodbye. Sam was unfailingly kind. Sure, he hid it behind banter, and that banter could be brutal, which is why I enjoyed him so much. For example, in the kitchen, uh, when we first joined the BBC, those of us who joined in 2018, there was a large supply of cutlery, which slowly started to disappear. But somehow, Sam went and ordered cutlery from Amazon. So whenever I needed like a, a fork to have my lunch with, Sam always had. He just wanted to take care of people. And as others have shared, there's not a bad bone in his body. Like I said, he was like an older brother to me. So it meant that sometimes it could be annoying. Sometimes you're like, ah, Sam, leave me alone, but loved him all the way. He was whip smart. He could look at an issue and right away go right to the heart of it and solve it. And above everything, he was a good friend. We would talk during the pandemic about everything and anything. I'd call him with technical issues as I was doing a daily broadcast from home, the BBC Africa Corona Minute. But always, always, we'd end up on the phone for at least an hour. You see, I just lost my dad, and those conversations meant so much to me. I don't know how he did it, but he didn't use that voice. You know that voice that people use when you've been bereaved, like, boy, so is everything. He never did that. 
he would actually say, eh, bado nalia wewe. But how he said it was so kind and immediately that would make me laugh. I will really miss that. I'm not sure what the office will look like without him or how it will feel looking to his office and realizing we'll never see him at his seat again. His passing is such a loss for all of us, his work family. I speak to you now, Sam. I hope you can see how loved and respected you are, not were, are. You will be missed in ways that we cannot fathom. Travel safe, my friend. Rest in peace. Asante Shiro. Um, I'd like to call Marcy Juma forward. Marcy will be reading a tribute on behalf of friend and colleague, Hassan Lali. Hello. Yeah, so this has been written by Hassan Lali, who is a great friend of Sam, a colleague and um, family friends. <coughs> when I think of Sam, I'll always remember his willingness to help others, his altruism, his charm, and his packiness. I joined the BBC in 2010, and Sam made my settling in super easy. I instantly felt at home. We became chums on day one, and I remember without wasting time, his cheeky, humorous nature brought him to say to me, Hassan Lali, speaking to you over the phone, you had a faint British Asian accent. We thought you are a sip, but you showed up as a black man. This comment still baffles me to date. Our tiny engineering room at Longonot Place was our little refuge from all the technical stresses, but also a center of excellence, thanks to Sam's guidance and work tradition that enabled me to learn quality, continuity, dedication, perfectionism, the whole nine yards. Sam equipped me with how not to fail when it comes to working. He knew how many beans make five. I got all the plan A's, B's, and C's from him. I am better today because of his foundation. When he's born with an character, Sam introduced me to the best of things. Our birthdays are two days apart and would at times cut cake together. Both of us being Virgos, we would fight for fastidiousness in everything we do. I would suggest the best and he would recommend the exemplary gadgets from mobile phones to high-end watches, music systems, food, fashion, you name it. And as soon as he acquired the latest models, his kind heart would push him to gift me some of his old gadgets that I still use today. I am forever indebted. There are many, many memories of the 12 years that I knew some. I would need a whole day to pay a proper tribute but I would end by thanking the Almighty for Sam's life. I want to thank Sam for being more than a brother, more of a brother than a colleague. There was a point in my life just, just as I had joined the BBC when I hit rock bottom and nearly gave up on life, but Sam was there for me, gave me a listening ear. He was my shoulder to lean on. I would incessantly spend days and nights in his house and he truly helped turn my life around and be where I am today. Thank you, Sam. We've been there for each other in our bright and dark days, right before you made your end. And I am so sorry. I did not do enough to help you this time round. I should have done more. I should have. I pray for peace in your final abode. I pray to God to give us all patience and the strength to accept your death. I am shattered. I am in denial. I will miss you, brave. I will miss you, Sam. So that's from Hassan Lali. And just before I sit down, maybe I'll just share like two light moments that I shared with Sam. <coughs> Sam was um, one of my very first friends when I joined the PVC back at Longo Notes. And I know I shared this with some friends in the office. I think it was my second week in the office and I went to Sam because I had an issue with my laptop. And then he 
sat me down and then he went through the laptop then gave me a pen and a paper and then he told me write one I wrote one then he told me write D I wrote D then he told me write 10 I wrote 10 then he told me write T then he told me read it <laughs> and it's written idiot <laughs> because the thing that I wanted him to fix was so basic it's something I would just have done on my desk <laughs> you know yeah so every time we met he made me he he called it the id 10 t error so anytime he told you to do he was like this is an id 10 t error and any new person would have hated some at that point because he took them through the id 10 t error which is the idiot error but he's just basically showing you but you know he went the extra mile and you know fixed it and we laughed about it and we grew into very good friends and i remember when we were doing the uh, working from home during the lockdown and then I went on air um, and Sam called me and he said that lighting is shitty it doesn't deserve to be on the BBC and I sent him a photo of what my setup looked like because it was my husband holding a phone like this lighting me up and my niece on this side holding a phone lighting me up so and then my sister was in the house so my sister had taken the photo so I shared that photo with Ruth who's my line manager and I share that photo with Sam. And then he's like, can I talk to your husband? Is he being paid by the BBC <laughs> to? <laughs> and in three days, I had a full kit at home. And he, the next time I went on air, he's, he called and he's like, yeah, now that deserves to be on the BBC. So he was that kind of a person. And I am broken and I'm so sad, but I, I just pray that some, you know, soars with the angels. And before I sit down, I'll read a poem and I hope it, you know, helps even one of us to just be able to navigate through this time. When tomorrow starts without me and I'm not here to see if the sun should rise and find your eyes all filled with tears for me, I wish you wouldn't cry the way you did today while thinking of the many things we did not get to say. I know how much you love me, as much as I love you. Each time that you think of me, I know you will miss me too. When tomorrow starts without me, please try to understand that an angel came and called my name and took me by hand. The angel said my place was ready in heaven far above and that I would have to leave behind all those I dearly love. But when I walked through heaven's gates, I felt so much at home. I promise no tomorrow, for today will always last. And since each day is the exact same way, there's no longing for the past. It is time to go and fly. As your guardian angel, I will try. Don't cry for me today. I'm on my way, soaring through the sky. I watch all of you telling me goodbye. So when tomorrow starts without me, <laughs> when tomorrow starts without me, do not think we are apart. For every time you think of me, remember I'm right here in your heart. All right, let's have George Rambo. Good afternoon. So, uh, my name is George Rambo, like he's mentioned, and uh, I mean, the videos you saw here, there's one person who's been consistent, and that's Anthony. So, I think it would be very prudent for us to just, you know, just check on him, because I know it's going to be extremely hard for him, besides his family, on uh, how he will proceed on after, with all this that has happened. And my deepest condolences to, to his family, 
and to the friends who are here and to the colleagues who just didn't see him as a colleague, but also as a friend. Uh, first, I'm non-editorial. All the guys you've been seeing talking are all editorial. So it means some did put a lot of impact even to us. Oh, I forgot Irene. Irene is also non-editorial. That was skipping me. <laughs> so in life, the ones who are the loudest, who have the loudest laugh, have the most broken hearts. We hide what eats us in the laughter. It's a disruption so that you don't see what we are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. The ones who are always there for, for everyone are the most lonely ones. That is one thing that I've sat and seen was with Sam. And that is what I've picked out of all this. Sam was the loudest in laugh. Sam was the, the one who was always there for everyone. And uh, it didn't matter what it was to him. You'd call him even in the middle of the night, he would pick your call. I remember during COVID time, uh, my cousin called me and uh, and he, he basically was t asking me, I know you guys are really advanced into this technology and conferencing and all that kind of stuff. My background is IT. My first five years of my career, I supported ATMs. So he asked me because he probably thought I would have an idea about it. But he, I told him, I, I can't really answer you, but I know someone who will basically give you the right answers. I was very impressed how some just spoke to him so effortlessly. He guided him, gave him every solution he could think, options, even up to the level of he could help him uh, order, up, order up these items that he required for his conferencing. I sat back and I was like, dude, you just did this. You don't know this guy, but you've given him so much information to a point you're even willing to order these things in for him. That was how selfless Sam was. For the ones who know me, they know I love my sneakers. And uh, I would wear them. I, I don't get to repeat my sneakers after a period of time. And some would be like, ah, umezidi banana wewe. But at the back of it all, he would come and be like, where did you get this? And he would be very clear on what colors he wants, what he needs, and all that kind of stuff. And he would he would do this every time and he would see something good. He would, he would avoid telling me in crowd because in the crowds, he's already rebuked me for my sneakers. So he would come on the side and be like, hey, you, easy, easy, easy. And we would just share and uh, I would tell him where I'm buying them and he'd be like, next time you're doing, get me a pair and things like that. He would call off, he would call you off when you did something that didn't sit well with him. That's not the perfectionate sum. We clashed a few times. First was in Lagos. Lagos, we were planning the new bureau and some branding was done really terribly at the reception area for the ones who've been in Lagos. And I remember we had a whole hour arguing and I kept telling him, I wasn't even here when this was being done. And he kept telling me, how can you be the one in charge of this and this is done and you're not here? And I told him, Sam, the continent is huge. I can't be everywhere at every given time, one time. And also it brought into some terribly done merchandise in, 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 in Lagos as well. And it didn't end. So after all that, I assumed you will continue brooding. I, I don't hold anything. For the people who know me, we finish what we say and I move on with my life. He called me and uh, we went for dinner at a Chinese restaurant just next to where we used to stay. And even at the restaurant, it felt like he was a chef at that day. He kept directing this guy what needs to be served and how it should be presented. And I told him, dude, let's just eat. What's with you? Come on. So, and a few times, you know, he would just call, he would just call me in the middle and we would talk for an hour. And I can't even remember what we talked about. Because half the time I'm, 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 I'm asleep and he's just, you know, telling me everything that I don't want to hear. And uh, I'd be just like, okay, fine. Are you done? Can we do this tomorrow? But he will keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on going. So, Sam has been part of BBC Footprint in the continent from South to North Africa. He's been in every bureau in this continent. 
he's played a very vital role as far as setting up BBC in this continent. In this continent. I remember in, in, in Lagos, they, they would always refer to him as Ogasam because he was a top dog in Lagos. Everything started and stopped with him. Any BBC office you'd go, whether you're in Dhaka, whether you're in Joburg, whether you're anywhere, the one person everybody would ask for is, where is Sam? Uh, there's one thing that Sam kept telling me. The day he knew Amluo, he was so, he was so thrilled with it because he kept asking me, what is dull name? Where did you get it? And I told him, you know, I'm Luo, so it, it comes with just being that. And he told me, yes, he's also Luo. I'm like, please, your name doesn't even sound anything Luo. And he went on to tell me, I'm a man of Nyadi, man of style. And for sure, some had class, more than any public primary school around here. And <laughs> he was there for everyone. I mean, there's a lesson in this. We spend most of our time in life in this place we call work. Very limited time we spend outside work. We have weekends and half the time we are asleep over the weekend. We go through so much at times and all we need to know is that we are not alone. I know there is the notion of everyone has his problems, but but it won't hurt just to be deliberate and intentional. I feel so indebted in my heart that I wasn't deliberate enough for him. Before the sudden passing of Sam, I spoke to him, I think, on Thursday, and uh, I told him I wanted to venture into something that required me to you know, get into, uh, get, 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 get into like, doing editing and all that kind of stuff. So we had a very long conversation on what exactly I wanted, what I desired, what I, what I looked for. And on that day, he told me he found the right thing that I was looking for. And he took me through the specifications of this thing that I wanted. And I asked him, do you have it? And he was like, no, 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 no. I, was, I just wanted to let you know first and you do it. What I'm bringing you is, will be very legit. Uh, and I told, he told me on Monday, now the Monday where he passed on, he was like, I'll be in the office, I'll bring you so you can see it. I shared with Purity what he had mentioned to me, and I told Purity, by the way, if you're in need, because Purity and I were more or less thinking of the same thing. And Purity was like, that's a very good thing that Sam is giving you. At the moment, I'm not ready, but let him bring, then we can, uh, we can see what it is. This is a MacBook, it's not anything out of the world. So, when I got that phone call, I hate, I hate Monday morning phone calls. I don't know for what reason. But that Monday phone call was just like, you know what, this guy is no more. So for me, Sam was very selfless. Sam was always present. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate that we are doing this for him. I, I kept telling him, I'm waiting for your retirement. And I kept telling him, I know your retirement is going to be big because your pension is going to be a lot. You've been here for so long. So kindly, consider me, and you can adopt me. And uh, he kept saying, Una ujinga sana. but, but that, that was just him. So he was a very private person. Just having some talk was not the easiest of things. You had to push him to the world for him to just say something. But it, it, it reminds me of something. In our African society, men are supposed to just stand and uh, just stand. You're not supposed to cry. You're not supposed to be weak. You're not supposed to share your emotions. I feel we are each other's keepers. We spend a lot of time together on our day to day. Let's find out. Let's be deliberate about, about just checking up on each other. A lot of guilt has hit me, but I know where he is, is at peace. It's not the kind of peace that you know we uh, would desire, but uh, I know I, I know he is at peace. So I'll, I'll uh, I don't want to make this place wet. Uh, let me call in uh, Moses. He could be having a, one or two things to say before the next person comes in. Kindly. Thank you, Moses.
Thank you, George. Um, as you said, my name is Moses. Uh, it's a tough day uh, for all of us. I must say, um, I was taken aback when Kevin Mashiro took us back many years ago when I met Sam um, at Longonot, when we just joined Mary and I as the non-editorial team. I think we were the very first non-editorial team to join the BBC and Sam we were in a makeshift kind of office, and Sam created this small space for both of us. And um, he first asked me that, do you like it? You know, there were the old PCs, not laptops, and a phone, like, you know, those government offices. And he said, do you like it? And I said, it looks good. You know, I was in a tie, you know, made in a kind of advertising, suit and we felt out of place and the guy made us feel at home let's be honest um, and when I think about it it's like he did the same thing very nice things to everybody you know the stories I've had since his passing um, are very touching but allow me uh, mom Helen uh, the sister to just share with you uh, these verses um, when Lazarus in the Bible was six in John 11, uh, six, the sisters called on Jesus. And um, when somebody is sick, they always pray that they'll be well. Unfortunately, Lazarus has passed away, and the sisters were so worried. So they called Jesus and asked, Sir, or master, what do we do? And this is what Jesus told them in John 11, verse 26. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. And even though they die, and whatsoever lives by believing in me will never die. And also in Revelation, we are reminded for those who are mourning that he will wipe away tears from their eyes. I know it's a very tough time for both for, for the family and colleagues, but we have to be strong for Sam because he was a strong guy. You know, he, he never, as we've said, he lived a full life. He never beat about the bush. Sam and I had a very interesting relationship. When I first joined the BBC, at some point we clashed uh, because of one, two, three things. But he never held any grudge against me. Um, as everybody has said, some always, I don't know why the thing with Lou was. If you remember me meeting Sam, I had a nickname for him, Mkamba Mjaluo. That's how I called Sam all along. Because he told me, Moses, I am a Luo, but I have a Kamba blood. Okay? Um, I, after we moved from Longono to Riverside, I really liked Sam in the way that he helped me with my interest in gadgets. Sam, you know, had the latest iPhone, the latest Mac. So I asked Sam, how come when I want to see you, you are always busy? So he told me, Moses, I'm a busy person. If you want to see me, you have to book an appointment. And that was Sam. So I told him, okay, Sam, I can't book an appointment weekdays because I'm busy. He said, I work a mere Monday to Sunday. Just tell me which day you want to come. So we sort of developed a relationship where every, I mean, Saturdays, when I needed something to do with Sam, I would go to the office on Saturdays. And I will always find him there, you know, with his cigarette or doing something. And sometimes Tony would be there. Uh, and he, he, would, he, would, he was so excited just to show you around, you know, what he's doing. It was, it was, it was amazing. Um, I don't want to repeat what everybody has said, but um, I'm reminded of a story of uh, President Roosevelt when he retired from office and came to Africa hunting, you know, uh, when, 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 when they retire, they do hunting. That's interesting. Um, and he was due for a public lecture in France. 
And if I quote him, he said, it doesn't matter what people say or think about you. What is important is that you show up and jump into the camp or to the stage. And I want to say, Sam showed up and jumped onto the stage. And he did his work well. He was very proud of his work. Um, he was very meticulous. Uh, he never faltered. I think there's a time he had a training here. I think it was on shortwave. I think Sam uh, Murunga might know. He spent a week, and that Saturday we met, and Sam took one hour to explain to me what they were, I was so lost. I didn't even know what he was talking about, but he went on and on, and that was Sam for you. There's something I want to say, and, and this is especially to my colleagues at the BBC that has been said about Sam. A lot of us know that Sam worked so hard. He worked so F hard, okay? He didn't want to be blamed for anything. And that meant he had to be in the office at odd hours, weekends. And I keep, I, feel, I keep wondering, is that something that is good or bad? OK? Does it take away something from you that is so essential? that is so crucial in your relations. It's good to work hard, but I have a question for my colleagues this afternoon. Um, maybe this need to work hard with moderation. I just want to condole with the family once more and say, Poleni Sana, uh, this has hit us hard, as they say, below the belt. Um, we didn't see this coming, and we are all grieving with you. May you find peace and comfort from the Lord, who provides every comfort that we need. Thank you. All right. Uh, kindly, someone who has KCN 459X Impreza uh, parked at the waterfront, you've left your window down. If you can just go and address it, that would be good. All right, let's have Augustine Ndianga. Is he here? All right. Good afternoon, yeah, guys. I'll request to change the waves of the language, so just I'll be with you. Okay. Kwa jina na ito Agasti Ndianga, ni nimefani na Sam from 2008 up to the date. Sam alikuwa rafiki yangu wa ndani kabisa I'm very sorry to say that because everybody was just asking me ni nini liendelea ndio sama kaga dunia juu nilikuwa karibu naye sana ambapo ningejua kitu ilikuwa namsumbua na hiyo kitu imenikula roho mpaka sasa hizi bado sijakuwa na amani juu Sam tulikuwa naye karibu sana Sam tulijua na naye long not place 20 2008 certain guys from air touch cooling system as a technician. Nilifanya kazi huko, akakuja, nikifanya kazi on Saturday. Akaniuliza brother, what's your name? Nikamwambia mimi naitwa Dianga. Dianga? Eh. I'm very sorry to say that are you coming from which tribe? In fact, I told him I'm a crossbreed. Crossbreed. Yeah. What do you mean with the cost of breed? 
my mother is a Luo and my father is a Mteso. So I'm a crossbreed, so I'm not from Luo land. Hey, when is Luo? Okay. Sa, nikafanya kazi. On Monday morning, pata kakuja, mini kakuja as normal, ndiyo ni sasa nifanya handing over. Haka muita spat. Pata kakuja. Haka muleza hii jama, nilimuleza hii ni wapi haka nambia ni crossbreed. Haka sema crossbreed, spat nambia haka uleza crossbreed. Are you crossbreed really? Haka niacha na wakaenda kwa fire exit, haka sama, haka uwa na choma huku chini. Nimebaki, nimezuba hapo kwa kantin. Nikifikiria kwa ni, eh, mambo hii crossbreed imetokia hapi, natuwa ni mbona ina wachoma watu. Ikawa hivyo nikafanya kazi vile nilikuja kwa contract hiyo jamaa mwingine nikamaliziwa na nilipo na mimi nikalipwa. Kufika the next week on hiyo ilikuwa Monday tukiongea na part on Tuesday nilienda kufanya kazi ndio the same same job AC ya conditioners to the office of the distant president elect Ruto alikuwa minister for agriculture at the moment. Sama kanipigia simu. Eh hey, dianga uko wapi? Nimeambia jamaa nimeenda huko kufukuhasu hapa nini kwa minister wa agriculture. Hiyo enzi ya tu kwa hiyo mambo ya hustling. So I to nilitumia hiyo lugha lugha ya vijana. So I'm just asking hapa minister for agriculture. Akaniambia okay, utamaliza saa ngapi? Nambia mtajala maliza kitu kama saa tisa hivi. Basa ukimaliza ukuje unione. Nikaenda ofisini, longo lot place. Nikapata na chora chora vitu zingine. It is my first time kuona unachora kwa unaona kwa screen. Mimi nazoea unazoea check na chora kwa karatasi. So tukaongea na yeye akaniambia bwana niko na project hapa. The sample is coming from London. Na I want you to fix them. So you are the best guy. Ako karibu na mimi ambaye anataka to fix this or whatever. So nikamwambia bas, can you fix them? Do you know how to read the plan? I know. Due to the education aliniambia, "Hey mazi" Hapa kufanya na watu ni ngumu. This lady is an avasika ndogo ndogo hawa. Wanasoma kisungu mingi so it is very difficult. Wewe kuongea kizungu. So nikamwambia, "Ai, Sam. Nitatoboa." Jo ladies are coming minister to minister to minister tunajua. Atulikuwa na wakina Vero, wakina Lucyba, Lucy, wakina somebody I know them. Akaniambia sawa on Tuesday on Wednesday akaniambia this is the plan. Haya. Nikazi ya kagua nikakagua kuka na ile elimu yangu ndogo hiyo pia. Na ameniambia wasana pia ni mrembo hapo chunga sana. Nikamwambia sawa tu mimi pia niko hapa mimi pia ni mrembo. Amani from Lowland. So In fact nikafanya quotation nika forward. Nilifanya quotation ya 500 and 200,000 500,000 kitu kama hicho akaniambia Dianga umeruhusiwa kufanya kazi it is on Thursday on Friday pesa ilitumwa it is my first time kuona pesa mingi maisha ni mwangu so nikatumiwa 500,000 Kenya shilling sina account juu siko na mifungo account nilitumia account ya brother yangu mdogo alikuwa mjanja kuniliko juu mimi i was just a carpenter generally profession Dianga, hii namba hii kitumia pesa utafika salamu kama mmeitafika huyu jamaa ni brother yangu na nimemwamini 500000 nikatumwa kwa account ya huyu jamaa alituma mpaka ya leba zote eh nikamwambia Sam unatuma pesa mpaka asijafanya kazi nikamwambia Dianga I trust you usiliambiwe ni crossbreed kwa hivyo una ile damu ya unajua hapo sasa sikutaja ha ilikuwa Friday ilibidi mimi mwenyewe sijaliambia inamaliza 3 hours alafu pesa hivi Nikachukua my brother hizi mabanks na kuna ruhusu pesa hivi after three days GM vitu kama hizo 72 hours. So nikaenda paka airport. My first time kuinga airport. Eh hey, tunafanya screening nasema eh hey, kwetu nenda wapi? Kumbe huyu brother yangu alikuwa mjanja na lewa. So tukaenda airport. Tukaenda pale bank na kutoa just was it tunatoa pesa to travel. Tukatoa pesa 500,000 nikabeba pesa nikashindwa. Eh hey, hii pesa nenda na wapi? Nika Kisha kumbuka Saturday nikaenda kubai materials. Saturday usiku nikafanya kazi mpaka asubuhi alipiga simu za 10 na kanambia dianga umefika wapi nipigie picha nikamwambia mama picha yangu ni bonoko mimi sina hii mambo ya touch eh <laughs> hey. so na kuja by saa 4 akifika saa 4 alikuja alikuja na some chakula kingine kutoka sije steers iko tetelinga post steers niliona hiyo karatasi imeandikwa steers 
eh. Akanipakulia, tunakula, tunakula na vijana wangu. Alafu nikamuliza Sam, sasa unileta chakula, bwana unajua mimi nimejelo from huko down Kenya. So, mbona ukuleta chakula iko na soup juu? Mimi nimelaki chakula juu. Sijaona soup kwa meza. Alinichekelea. Ikawa hivyo tumeenda hivyo, juu alikuwa the best friend, tulikuwa na Jeliana naye, tunaongea naye kuhusu kikazi, ikawa my first time kuonekana kwa screen. This is the second day kuonekana kwa screen. Maisha ni mwangu. Tulikuwa na wengine sijui a certain journalist uh, alikuwa along the middle east ikawa tunafiga piga tape hivi msiongee na unapigwa picha hapo alongo na utapo juu tulikuwa na some lady anaitwa Charlotte na some second na uh, Sharon Charlotte Charlene Charlotte yeah na Ken Mungai alikuwa photographer tuone mashaka tulikuwa naye eh hey, nikaona Mimi napigwa picha hivi na jiona ukule. Nimefunga budomo na cello tape. Nikasema eh kumbe inakuwa kitu hivi. So Sam nimepita mambo mingi na kutoka kwa Sam na hata mimi ni udhinisha sana juu hiki kifo chake si geni vile. Ni kitu tulikuwa naona token hii kileke hivi. So tukama along one note. Tukaenda Riverside. Hakati tulikuwa na watu wote hamisha along one note. Tukaenda Riverside. I think there was such an election in Uganda. <coughs> Wakapanga na Anto. Funny chas zikafanywa zingine auction na akaniambia dianga mimi napanga wewe ndo fanya setup wapi? Uganda. Nikamwambia eh Sam mtenda Uganda na Uganda kama changira ina chapo hivi. Sisi changira sio ni this guy bisegi. Eh bisegi na chapo hivi na museveni mimi nikienda huko na unajua sisi waze wajamii wote walibaki huko kutoka along the river Nile. Si mimi ndachapo sana akaniambia pana. Do you have passport? Na mwambia, "Ai, passport hiyo sasa ndio nimeanguka juu sasa." Huko wanahitaji vitu mingi. Na mimi sita bad birth certificate. Ai. Sasa ndio fanya jina. Tu ni tena cheka tukiwa naye. Ai, tu wakapakua vitu, zaenda UG zimeenda, tu zingine tunatoka, tunapeleka Riverside. Riverside ni join battalion. The generation nilipata tulikuwa na a certain guy, Moses Kalande, I think it is here. Great, great my brother. Sam is gone nowhere to be seen again. Thank you. Tulifanya setup ya Nine River side tukamaliza na Tony. Tulikuwa naingia kazi very in the morning. Saa 12 tu amesha to pick up Ayanda in house. Tukienda job. Sam ni mtu alikuwa anapenda kazi yake na Sam anajasema kupenda kazi kwake ndio amefanya hawa wote warembo wote hawa. Wamefanikiwa juu ya Sam. Juu hakuna mtu amekuingia hapo bila kupitia mkono wa Sam. Mi Asaleman from Luland ambao hakuwa na elimu na si kwa na uwezo sasa hizi nazionekana kwa TV so wonderful and I appreciate him Tumekuwa na Sam along the weekends tunashinda tunafanya naye kazi sasa zingine kazi na Arabika wajuaji ambao wamesoma unajua kisungu mingi wanasema alafu baadaye wanaenda nyumbani wana expect by Monday kile kitu sawa Na yenyewe Monday watapata everything is okay mpaka wanasanga kwa ni nyinyi mnafanya kazi sangapi hii weekend yetu tumefanya na Sam mpaka tumepata everything is okay. Weekend tunakula. So harakati corona covid imekuja. Tunaongea na yeye na Sam. I'm just a minor. I'm a minute. Uchunglu kwa hii company. Na ah wanasema watu wana working from home. Naona una build some computer hapa hivi. Sasa hii nyundo yangu na screwdriver hivi nitafunga nyumbani nilipwe. Hey, sasa kama nimebeba na hiyo swali umuliza mazeni hard lakini si hata mimi mimi nashindwa lakini tutaona alinimotivate yeye na Tony huwa tunakuja weekends zile kazi zinafanyika tunafanya kawaida tu mpaka corona ikasi nikamwambia Sami mbona uje uja chanjo juu ya corona kaniambia bwana hii corona vile nilitoka majua leo tusije alitoka Sierra Leone akakuwa quarantine hiyo kitu iliendaga hivyo so pengine tumpita Sami ni mengi bwana Moshiro thank you Tulikuwa na state house nikiamsha Sam. Nimepreka hapa hill, nimemhamisha hapa hill, nikapreka mpaka si ukimao. Everything nyumba yake painting, campaign tree work, everything mimi nimefanya. Na ameniuza among this wafanyakazi wenzetu ni sidhani ni wachache tu ambao ni sio alafiki ni wachonde wajanipea mimi job kulingana na Sam. Unjua kabla hujanipea job ni wewe ni mchoyo juu. Sam amenijenga kila mtu amemfanyia kazi hapa. So nikiongea mambo ya Sam nasikia leo niko sawa juu tu tangu sama age sijamuona nilikuwa naomba at least upate nafasi ni muone mwili at least 
roho yangu iridhiki lakini na, naona leo nimegeni momentum i appreciate my team managers nime appreciate nyinyi mmoja nichukulia kama mtu uchungu lumbi lenyu mnajua huyu mtu ni mtu anafaa na anafanya kazi ambayo ina benefit company nimefanya kazi hizo siku zote ikiwa sama kama contractor nafanya quotation nafanya evaluation nafanya kazi na lipwa ikifika wajuzi last year, last year but one sam na pat sama on sunday akanikujia akaniambia dianga tumeona tumefanya kazi na from 20 2008 mpaka sasa hizi tulikuwa na unalea at least utu join to pay contract nikamwambia sam si wewe unajua jaluo jua kikwitu watoto wa hesabu hivi lakini kwa wale wanaona mimi ni wangu wote niko na saba na kama eh diana huko na watoto wa saba bwana very great wewe <laughs> niguka nikamwambia mimi niguka of course yeah okay okay sasa sasa so kitu tunafanya naye hivyo tu mimi tuseme ni accidentally ama ni i can't elaborate it so nilikuwa mgonjwa na wakaka sina nilikuwa nimelemewa kabisa the satema nilipata nikilala along the balcony hapo hivi kaniambia dia umelemewa brother mose can tell that dia nga umelemewa nikamwambia tu sam haki nimelemewa lakini kwa vile kazi yangu lazima niwe physically ndio nifanye nini lakini sina nguvu kaniambia dia nga please nimeenda kuongea na parts enda nyumbani nifanye nini u relax nilikuwa nilemewa at the weight of 71 umerudi mpaka 46 Sama aliangalia hivi na Tony akaniambia baba enda upumzike. Si kupumzika hata umeenda mbinguni lakini enda relax tu nyumbani. Angalau ugeni nguvu. <coughs> Alafu usiji ni roho ilingia muhimu mwao. Wakanuna certain uh, staff. Ilikuwa certain unga nyingine funny funny hapo hivyo na tusikitu kama 25 kg. Walipea mimi nikaenda nayo shago. Sasa njoo mimi niko hapa na watoto mama ndiye na shughulika akaniambia wewe kazi umefanya wacha tukutakulipa na wende home nikaenda nyumbani nimekaa for 32 days nikitumia hiyo that stuff tuziweza is kama selak unjoe vile selak ni tamu so mimi na nikiwekewa kijiko mbili watoto pia nyuma yango wanawekewa za na imeandikwa still mtoto zaidi ya 18 years afanye nini aga kunyo hiyo whatever so ikawa tunavurukana na watoto watoto pia wanaingia ah dadia kisochoka malala hivi sisi pia tunanyemelea na ngono nini hiyo mazewa so likuwa hard nikapona nikampigia picha nikafunga kikoi mimi ndio nimebeba mjuku wangu ambao nilipea stress juu stress ilikuwa watoto wangu wawili walipata ball yani jana ya vijana so wakaenda kufanya mitiani ya form 4 so hiyo kitu iliniingia akili mpaka ikwa sijui penye niko So nikakuja akaniambia eh dianga huko yuko sawa. Baada ya huko sawa please enda nyumbani wiki mo. Wiki moja nikaenda nyumbani wiki moja. Okay ona anto. Nikakaa wiki moja nikakuja. Part pia anakuja ninaangalia. Na iko swali lingine ilikuwa naliza hapo BBC ambapo bado iko. Uko sawa? Hiyo swali iko sawa ukiuliza baba. Hii mazi. Akaniuliza dianga uko sawa nikamwambia niko sawa. Eh okay. Pata akakuja akaniambia dianga uko sawa. In fact si kujua kama pata najua Kiswahili. So nikashindwa. Hii part nitaongea ni lugha gani? Jiu Kisungu, influence Kizungu, continuously kitu kama hivi mimi kama yule former governor wa Nairobi. Kuongea Kizungu ni ngumu. So nikasema hii Kiswahili ilikuwa hard juu mimi nilifundishwa penye hakuna Kiswahili. Nikasema hivi nilinunua Kiswahili nikuja Nairobi itabidi niongee Kiswahili kabisa. Na sama akanipea influence akanambia, "Ah warembo, ukiongea Kiswahili utasikia." Kwa hivyo wewe katu kidete kwa hiyo Kiswahili yako. Nikamwambia, "Okay." Na nikaona nyewe warembo wakaniblow nayo na mimi pia wana pia job inafanya so i appreciate so sam the last day ambapo tulikuwa na sam it was on tuesday nikampata ka a certain viatu eh akaniambia nikamwambia eh sam na hivi viatu yako tunamwitika viatu ni mokasim iko sawa mimi eh ni sawa ni ni kama ile yako iliharibika wakati tulikuwa na maisha tulipata viatu zingine huwa haivai so nikamwambia hii ni ulifaa vizuri vizuri haiharibiki kama ile ilikuwa ya nyumbani kanapa eh eh sasa iko sawa ana utaibia ta 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 tunangotia ndio kama amaze umeongeza wewe tuko sawa eh ha uko sawa brother amaze sawa so tukaacha na hivyo lakini kama mwana anakuambia sawa nika 
umekosa usingizi juu naona ni kama tulikuwa naongea na yeye na gaubaga tukiwa naye so hiyo ilikuwa last wednesday or last tuesday so hiyo tulikuwa tukisha naona na yeye tukiwa set up na na, na Serena Hotel wakati wa set up ndio sama alinijibu maswali lingine ambapo mpaka sasa hii nafikiria mbona hakuniambia mapema juu kama angekuwa analekea hapo ningepata advice kama mzai junior just my admit lakini huwa ananiita guka juu mimi sasa na wajukuu alikuwa anatembea eh nikamuliza Sam nimetumwa and nilete carpet yeye along the stairs wenye nilikula Serena wanajua hiyo stairs kwenda paka huko juu tulifanya mpaka usiku sasa nikamuliza Sam uh, unaona ni kala gani ambao tunaweza chukua tuweke hapa kwa stairs from those year, 13 years ama 14 years Sam alinijiba is none of my business eh nikaenda kwa zangu naomba Sam amenijibu na hiyo swali aniridhishi akaniona pia nime nimekuwa haunted kwa roho mimi pia natembea pia natembea alafu nikamwendea tena tulikuwa na jina lingine tuna joke naye nikamuita Tapir ananiita Dino Dino hii ni a nickname nilipewa na former project manager Astar Bay kutaja Diana ilikuwa hard so ilikuwa ananiita mi Dino eh akanamba eh Dino azi Ujumbe na Zoya Nairobi Express. So hizi na za panda nishuke pale chi pale chini. Hmm. Ai sikufikia nime hiyo jamaa ananiambia ananiambia nini. Na ikao hivi na akaenda tu hivyo. So it is very sad. The last bit tuliongea naye ilikuwa that Tuesday na ameenda please. Uliza mwezo wako karibu na wewe uko hai? Uko hai? Mwezo wote uko karibu na wewe hebu muulize tu uko hai? Do that life is very important kwa maisha yetu. Muwe mna share kitu nasumbuka roho. Ongea na mwenzako time zote. Akinlezi kina gaubaga. I used to talk to Sam Ve, usiku. Sam alikuwa ananiongelesha mpaka saa 8 usiku. Kuongea ni muhimu tafadhalini. Nimewashukuru wazazi. I know you. You know me as a family friend from the Wadogo in Kat Mam tulikuwa na wewe brother tulikuwa hapa ili tukihamisha Sam nika drive mpaka huko na kile kitu nimefanya huko nyumba nafikiri nyinyi mnanijua madhi wakati tulikuwa nakuja nduletea usoro mpaka hiyo usoro nilikuwa nauliza i daily ilo so wa mama bado iko ananiambia dianga iko hata leo ndio ananiletea nyingine mpya nikamwambia please kunywa uji ongeze momentum uwe na uwe una uzito Juu niko na fry akiongeza tu mimi nilikuwa 46 nikiongeza mpaka saa hii niko 72 really so that's a great I honor you my mom Jean tofauti vile watu wanafuata lakini tuamini Mwenyezi Mungu Asante ni Mungu awabariki thank you very much Oh come on you can give him a better hand All right let's have a uh, beletu bulbula I, I guess this is from all right yeah from Ethiopia thank you very much good afternoon um many of you have already talked about Sam's behavior and about his uh, kindness which he managed to influence many of us through what he has been doing and have done let me talk about some very brief thing uh, i met uh some in 2017 when i came um, as a new joiner uh, from ethiopia uh, as part of the uh, bbc expansion program then at that time we didn't have a such close uh, relationship but uh, I we started closely working with Sam after we moved to Riverside 
uh, when we've been trying to introduce or launch our radio programs and also the time we launched our website. Uh, Sam was, um, he's always constant with sense of humor. As a newly launched uh, service, no person hesitated to ask him for help for technical issues because we've been going through uh, a lot of technical difficulties to establish uh, our website and uh, launch our radios. I went to his, ho his office with so many questions, with so many issues for help many times for which he always had a solution to make me relax and put a smile on my face. Especially during the, <laughs> the COVID lockdown, <laughs> CPS crash, internet connectivity, Adobe, Audacity, <laughs> computer failure, the scaler, those are <laughs> the, the issues. <laughs> uh, most of the time, I'm just nagging uh, Sam Kenny, but always he's constant and decent, and he fixes it. <laughs> I don't remember the time he, he failed to pick my phone calls, be it during week working days or over the weekend. If he's on another call, definitely he calls me back or he texts me. Especially during the COVID lockdown, that was the time when we must start talking closely because he, he comes to the office over the weekend, I also frequently go to the office to work from there. And we used to talk, chat, and joke, and sometimes laugh. I think that time, both of us prefer to go to office uh, just to escape the loneliness from home because of the lockdown. That is what I've learned a little. He silently come to my place and gives him, give me a hug. Sam was such a professional person, not only a professional colleague, but also a true human. That is what I learned through the process. His kindness and decency, which touched the life of every of us. Samuel, a gentleman with beautiful soul, diligent with his work. He hugged me for the last time three weeks ago, the time when we had an appointment to go and visit him and to eat in Jara at his place. What he told me, he used to eat in Jara, the Ethiopian traditional food from his, since his childhood. I, I, I couldn't make to go and see him because of some other issues. I'm really sorry, Sam, for not keeping my word is to make that day. I cannot I hide my how I how I sad I am. I'm still blaming myself about it. I want to say thank you always for talking taking time to talk to me for hugging me, for helping me, for putting a smile on my face. You beautiful soul, rest in peace, 
Sir. All right. Uh, let's have uh, Rachel in place of uh, Anthony to give tribute for Anthony. Okay. Um, I think one name that has been mentioned uh, over this morning has been Anthony Mwashwega. Anthony, as I said earlier, uh, was a very close friend of Sam. They worked together, and I used to call them twins because they were always together. Ant Anthony has requested me to read um, his tribute on his behalf. So here we go. Dear Sam, my big brother, closest friend, confidant, mentor, boss, advisor, and so much more. Only God knows how many lives you touched with your selfless and generosity. I'm testament to this because of spending so much time together. You gave me a chance when I was just a teenage boy. You mentored and guided my career. There is no way I could thank you enough or repay you SK, but I'll mirror your generosity and selflessness every day. Thank you for the countless stories and jokes you shared when we were hanging out or working long hours, days on end. I hope I was good company for you because you sure were for me. I'm so sorry you suffered so much these last few months when everything seemed to have gone so wrong. I keep thinking of the different paths we would have taken. Maybe things wouldn't have ended up here. We are all in great pain and sorrow, but we will remember the many years of happiness and laughter that you shared with so many people. Ian says you are in heaven, setting up for the Queen's reception. It makes sense. Only the greatest would be call up, called upon for a heavenly OB. That's an outside broadcast. As I bid you farewell, Sami K, I wish you peace and all the divine luxury you deserve. Rest in peace, the great Sam Kenny. Mutu wanguvu sana. I'm going to read a tribute from Sheila. Sam's love. Um, Sheila's based in Canada. And she reads, and, and I read, KK, just in a blink, a beautiful soul went down. My dreams were shattered. My heart is broken. You never said I'm leaving. You never said goodbye. Your love and care for everyone was far and beyond. Committed to your work and professional ethics. Diplomatic, you were calm and composed. And that's how 15 years happened. If love alone could save you, you never would have died. I failed to protect you and l later was a minute too late. Had I known that that was our last call, my flight would have been sooner. Our plans were cut short. My soul is bleeding with no sense of direction. Your peace and peace were you. The world is now an empty place which has been torn apart. The rhythm of my heart is beating like a drum. 8,000 miles apart, nothing seemed difficult. Suddenly, all went dead. In the bar of my heart, we'll always be your home. I know you're at peace in a place where you are free. <sighs> Meet me at the pearly gates when heaven calls for me, where the ocean meets the sky. I will be sailing. Love is immortal. Sheila. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kevin Mochiro. I worked at the BBC almost 10, left the BBC almost 10 years ago. Worked with Sam for almost six. We were friends, we were colleagues, then we became neighbors. He's the one who got me the flat on State House Crescent, just so we're next door neighbors. Um, and after I left the BBC, our friendship just grew. Sam was a confidant, 
I even tried sharing pictures of food with him. They were aptly called mashakuras. <laughs> and I was insulted as well. And I never tried again. But Sam was my boy. You've heard about the technical sides of Sam, how he made stuff happen across the BBC. But that kindness, that kindness transcended all, even to many, even outside the BBC. And for me, this is a story of kindness, of because this is who Sam was. In 2016, Sam was in South Africa for a while. He was producing a marathon man for Eddie Izzard, who was a UK comedian. And Eddie was running a marathon every day in South Africa. And Sam was part of the technical team. And told Nakumbuka, yeah, it was hard work. And Sam knew I was, I was a runner then. But Sam, and at that time, I just started chemotherapy and I was going through treatment. And just like everybody else, Sam would call, Ukosawa, Temba Zinafanya job. I'd say yes. And that was it. But this is the measure of the man that Sam was. Eddie Izzard, along the way, he, he convinced Eddie Izzard, I don't know how, but he convinced Eddie Izzard to send a video to encourage me as I battled cancer. Eddie Izzard had seen on TV in the UK, but all of a sudden, Eddie Izzard is calling out my name, telling me to run my race. It didn't end there. When Eddie Izzard ran his last marathon, I think it was in Cape Town, there was the ticker tape, you know, that had marathon man. Sam, man. Sam came with the ticker tape and gave it to me. And I used that ticker tape when I went to India. And it has been with me every, every time as an encouragement to keep on running my race. Such was the measure of the man. And we're all here to remember him and celebrate him for his kindness. I love poetry. I'm a storyteller. And uh, Joseph Warungu, I almost blame you for that. Um, but I just want to share this um, poem that I found, Jana. Though we need to weep your loss, you dwell in that safe place in our hearts where no storm or night or pain can reach you. Your love was like the dawn, brightening our lives, awakening beneath the dark, a further adventure of color. The sound of your voice found for us a new music that brightened everything. Whatever you unfolded in your gaze, quickened in the joy of its being, you placed smiles like flowers on the altar of the heart. Your wind always sparkled with wonders and things. Though your days here were brief, your spirit was alive, awake, and complete. We look towards each other no longer from the old distance of our names. Now you dwell inside the rhythm of breath as close to us, as close to us as we are to ourselves. Though we cannot see you with outward eyes, we know our soul's gaze is upon your face, smiling back at us from within everything to which we bring our best refinement. Let us not look for you only in memory, where we would only grow lonely without you. You would want us to find you in presence, besides us when beauty brightens, when kindness glows and music echoes eternal tones. When orchids brighten the earth, darkest winter has turned to spring. May this dark grief flower with hope in every heart that loves you. May you continue to inspire us May you continue to inspire us, Sam, to enter each day with a generous heart, to serve the call of courage and love until we see your beautiful face again in that land where there is no more separation, where all tears will be wiped from our mind and where we will never lose you again. All right, let's have uh, Chris McKenna, please. Good afternoon. 
um, when I had about Sam's passing, I was broken. I remember messaging Yvonne and I was like, I know th and this is a dream, you know. I can't believe that Sam is gone. When I joined the BBC in 2018, I remember the first one month, second month, Sam noticed that I loved wearing suits. So he told me, I like you, you're very different. But I want to tell you something, that this is not local media. So see your go pay, even if you don't wear a suit, you won't be fired. So if you want to wear a t-shirt, shorts, be comfortable, do whatever you want. But he realized that I just loved wearing suits and we always used to, every single time we meet is like, I like that suit, you know, where, where did you get it? Connect me with your person. Then in 2019, something happened. Um, and I remember the whole you know, office was constantly checking up on me. But Sam went the extra mile and I remember he called me, he said, you need to come back to the office. And I kept on telling him, Sam, I'm not yet ready. I'm not yet ready to come and sit, you know, in an office full of people with whatever has happened. He said, what do you want? What can I do to make your life easier, comfortable? I said, if I come back, then I will want to maybe sometimes come and work from your office. He said, consider it done. I remember when I came back to the office the first day, he told me, you have a space in my office any single time you don't feel comfortable. And that always used to happen. He used to come, find me there, we talk, then I continue with my day, and he was just always, always just speaking to me and just always speaking positivity and love. I miss Sam because of the kind of person that he was. Sam was definitely a gift to us from the universe and from God. And today we mourn him, but even as we mourn him, I, I want us to celebrate the gift that Sam was. Because when everybody is standing here to talk about many different things, everybody's just saying, Sam was there for me. I feel so sad that we did not know the kind of pain that he was going through, that I did not know the kind of pain that he was going through, because when I left the BBC, we did not talk much. But today, I just want to say to mom, to his brother, everybody from his family, we celebrate him no matter what, because Sam was a gift to all of us. I miss you, Sam, and continue, continue being that gift wherever you are, always in my heart. Let's have uh, Tabitha Griffith. Before I start uh, reading my tribute, if for nothing else, I want to start by confirming to Rachel Akidi that <laughs> she spoke earlier and she, she, she spoke about the fact that she once asked Sam if he was living rent free at the BBC offices. So I want to reassure you that indeed he had a place and when he left BBC at whatever time, whether it was at midnight, 3 a.m., he went back and he went back to some of us. He came back home to some of us. Although listening to you, I should have probably advised him as a friend not to pay rent if he was always at the office. I equally know that for everyone who spoke, there's an acknowledgement that Ben, I mean, Sam was a workaholic and people then might be asking, did he even have time for friends? And did he even have friends outside of BBC? And I want to confirm by standing here that indeed he did. He had friends outside of BBC. And the, the truth is that for some of us who have known him for such a long time, every time I would pick him up because he would, he would never drive, I would call him and tell him that I am approaching the Longonot office and he would tell me very quickly, you know, with his backpack and with his badge, and he would come quickly swiping at the door, and he would tell me in, you know, in Swahili, Rudi nyuma, Rudi nyuma, mafisi wako hapa, Tony atakuona. And that is how I never got into the BBC offices, but I would pick him up constantly, and I was discouraged from coming into the BBC offices. I don't know how many of you know how to make duck. 
soaked in red wine as a routine in your houses for dinner. I don't know how many of us here can quickly whip up chicken wrapped in bacon with a side of baby potatoes and asparagus. I don't know how many of us here have a soda making machine in our homes. And if you don't have that, and if you can't cook such meals, then you and I cannot be friends because those were the standards that some set out for our friendship. And over the past seven days, I have typed, edited, uh, retyped this tribute because the tears just wouldn't let me finish a sentence and the lump in my throat makes it very hard to give a befitting tribute to you, my darling. What started out in 2005 as a simple lunch at your place turned out to be many years of me morphing from being your cousin's girlfriend to being your pimp because I insisted and I kept asking him, why don't you have a girlfriend? I haven't seen your girlfriend. And he would cook and then I would forcefully bring a parade of babes and insist and with each one of them, he would tell me I didn't like her nose. <laughs> she chewed too roughly. I didn't like how she looked. And over the years, even with this friendship, I also morphed from being just a friend to being your lawyer. And I have to now publicly declare that you did dutifully pay for every single work that you commissioned. Sam, you had a smart mouth. And each phone call between us always started with banter. And I had to shout and tell you, whoa, speaker, usichome. So that at some point you would shout unprintable names that I can't say here. And in most instances, you'd complicate every simple discussion that we had with such beautiful, brilliant angles that made me just resort to shouting so that I could win the argument, and yet I was the lawyer. You hated leaving the comfort of your house, and Gitao's taxi became my ride each time I needed a good meal and expensive wine. Sam, you would scream at me if I added salt to your cooking. You would bitch for hours, excuse my French, how I left one strand of hair in your sink because you hated Messi. One time when we were in Johannesburg, you took back a steak because it was not bleu at the Holiday Inn in Rose Rosebank. And you took back this steak three times. And by that time I was getting embarrassed and I was really, really sure that they were going to poison us as revenge. Sam was meticulous, opinionated, and very, very choosy. But you were also very unapologetic about the things that you liked. You had a fantastic, sharp, and expensive taste. And over the years, my ears suffered listening to all the stories because each wine that I drank at your house, each perfume that you had, each gadget that you brought had a story. And you were a really, really generous giver. To the BBC family, I want to reassure you all that Sam indeed did love his job. And on many occasions when I was at either his first house or the second in Upper Hill, we would be in the middle of drinking and cracking jokes and Sam would pause. And then he would lift his finger, shake it, rush to the bedroom that he had converted into an office space and then he would hurriedly just switch on these two screens, these two huge screens that he had. And then as he was doing this, he would then shout back at me as I was still in the living room. And he would say, I think I've figured it out. And then I would be summoned to come and see what the problem was and how he was going to solve it. Part of the solutions that I, in my drunken state, participated in was the BBC office transition from Longonot to the Riverside offices. And in hindsight, now that I am sober, 
I just want you to know in my capacity as a lawyer that I want to categorically state that should you ever find any defects in your offices, I just want you all to know that those mm, ah, okays were not necessarily approvals from me of the alterations that he did in that state, but it was simply my way of looking, trying to look like I understood what exactly he was showing me on those two big screens in the middle of drinking. Colleagues, friends and family, all this stuff that I'm sharing is the glue that was the bond to our friendship. And I really don't know which versions the world got of him, but I got the best version. I got the most honest, the most vulnerable version of him. If I knew that the last time I was going to see him was when we stamped those house agreements, I would have probably hugged him a little more. I have listened to everyone here say how happy he was to move from Upper Hill to Siokimau. But there's a part of me that is struggling to accept my participation in how he transitioned to Siokimau. Because he came very quickly and asked me, where are you? And I said, I'm, I'm still at home. And he said, I am coming with a sale agreement and I am coming with the documents and I need you to sign them. This was probably the only work that he never paid for. And at that point, I kept on pushing him even after we finished the transition and I told him, the house is now yours. What are you waiting for? Moving into it. If I knew that that was the last time that I would have seen him, I would probably equally have said something to annoy him one last time. Sam, your departure has not been all dark and gloom, and some good has come out of it. In the last seven days, I've gotten to see mutual friends whom I've not seen in years. And one of those friends is Tony because immediately I met Sam, Tony came as part of the package. You had to be friends with Tony if you were friends with Sam. I've equally got to meet some of the people that Sam referred to me as clients along the way of our friendship. I met Maggie, and about two days ago, I also equally managed to meet some of the amazing team of colleagues that you worked with. So, just like we have ended each call, each conversation, each debate, over the years, I want to end this one very respectfully with some unprintable names, because these are the same names that we have shouted at each other daily, but only this time you won't shout them back. Let's have Vlad, please. Hello, can you hear me? Um, first of all, I would like to express my condolences to the family. I mean, we knew Sam, Sam really well, and I can't imagine what you're going through. Sam, as we all know, was larger than, than a lot of things. Um, on the sad day of his, his passing, it was striking to hear people crying in Ukraine, in Washington, D.C., in London, across Africa, in Lagos, in Johannesburg, and it wasn't just a, an expression of sadness, it was, a, it was just a reflection of how much he touched people he knew. Um, I, th I think a lot has been said right now about who Sam was and what he represented. I think the tribute that I would like to give to him is celebrate his life in many ways. 
Um, there are two things that I take that I'm grateful to have met Sam, and I know people who, who work with me closely outside of, of Kenya who would agree with this, is the fact that he was selfless, and that's something that I'm grateful to have met Sam for. I want to know, I want to tell myself all the time, what else can I do to help someone? What would Sam do in a moment like this? And I want to take that with me as, 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 an, as a tribute to him, to the friendship we had since we met, I don't know, just before 2010 and the World Cup in South Africa, an event, by the way, that wouldn't have occurred if Sam wouldn't have been there. And the second thing I would really like to pay tribute to Sam is um, his sense of excellence. He wouldn't just be satisfied with doing the smallest task, work, life, the duck with wine, the cable here, whichever, anything he would be doing, it had to be the best. It had to be the best ever. He, he was never satisfied. And I take that, uh, that question away with me from now on. Is this good enough? Am I doing good enough? Would Sam have been satisfied with something like this? I want to pay tribute to him in these two ways, in, my, in the rest of my life. And I'm grateful that I've met him. And again, my sincere condolences to you, Boleni Sana, and to everyone who has known Sam here. Abdinur, please. Uh, I'd like to begin by taking this opportunity uh, to pay my most sincerest and deepest condolences to the beloved family of our brother, Sam Kenny. This is my first ever memorial. Uh, to attend and to talk. And uh, it isn't by coincidence, because this is a God's way, uh, God's way of telling us uh, to value and give back to the people who've uh, given their lives to us. And Sam Kenny, when I first joined the BBC in 2015, in April, uh, he set up for me the password for the computer. And of course, it's part of his, uh, it was part of his duties. But it was more than setting up uh, the user logins. Uh, my colleagues at the BBC uh, who are familiar with that know that it is uh, a normal process. When I uh, heard about uh, the sad uh, developments, I couldn't believe. I searched on all social media. Uh, being a digital media enthusiast myself, I couldn't get any uh, verification. I searched and searched, and until I saw someone posted a, a picture of an obituary, and that is when it hit me hard. To be honest, uh, as Muslims, we believe that death um, is for all of us, and it's a process uh, that waits each and every one of us. But uh, it hits us differently, because Sam Kenny made emotional investment to all of us at the BBC and beyond, as uh, uh, testimonies given by everyone who came here before me, my seniors, my editors, and uh, family members. As a Muslim at the BBC, uh, and as a company, that I believe, uh, you know, from my experience there, the, the, the diversity, Sam Kenny actually uh, helped make it have a meaning at the BBC. During the five daily prayers, there are some two, uh, which we did at home and at the mosque, and those ones that found us at the, st at the studios, the afternoon ones, the evening ones, and Sam Kenny always, when there was a live program ongoing or there was no any other space, he usually found a way to let us pray. And that really meant a lot to us. And uh, when the BBC was relocating to uh, Nine Riverside, actually Sam Kenny came to us and he told us that Mtacha kusumbuka na kujiosha kule kwenye washroom because uh, we've set up an abolition place for you and we've also set up a prayer place for you. This is someone we never had any religiously related discussion. And it tells you about the kind of uh, creatures God uh, brings in our midst uh, to show us that he exists. And uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, those who have mercy on others, God also uh, brings mercy to them from the heavens. And there is also another Swahili quote which I had a few uh, months back, which says, Monadamu ni shahidi wa munyizi mungu. As a family, you might have lost a loved one, but I think uh, the 24 years 
He has been with the BBC, I believe. That is enough to tell you that he was more than just a son, he was more than just a brother, and he continues to live amongst us. On behalf of my Muslim colleagues at the BBC from every part of the world and all the other language services, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, he was our brother, he was one of our own, and just to know that uh, you have contributed uh, to this world by giving us a son that who shall continue uh, to be remembered for the goodness he left amongst us. Sorry for this, uh, because of time, uh, allow me uh, to share our last, not uh, wasn't supposed to be our last conversation, but it, God has his way. So when I, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have loved to use the word left, but I will say uh, when I had gone to pursue my studies uh, from the BBC in 2017, I wrote uh, Sam Kenny a message uh, from WhatsApp. I told him, my antivirus expires in two days. I have been trying to renew from Turkey, but they deny cause of location. I have my visa card. Is it okay to share the link for renewal and card details later so that you can help me renew? He texted me back and he said, starting with my name, Abdinur, just uninstall that software. Get a free antivirus. AVG should work okay. So I would really like to thank him for that. And uh, sorry, as, an, as a sports enthusiast myself, and uh, on Sundays I used to be on duty because of the BBC uh, Swahili, we used to have a sports evening edition. So we followed, our, I'm an Arsenal fan myself, and we used to follow those games. So, and that is an off day for Sam Kenny, but we will call him and tell him, Banasam ile channel, they have put something else on that channel. What do we do? We have flicked through, but we cannot get to watch the games. So, and of course at that time, I don't know why we couldn't imagine live streaming. Maybe it wasn't yet open. So Sam will come back to the office with his slippers and his uh, short trouser and his khaki shirt, and he will set it up for us. Many before me have spoken about the goodness. Some have uh, witnessed and continue to live that testimony. I wouldn't love to say more because I believe uh, his actions have left a lot in us. And uh, as my brother preceding me had earlier said, we shall continue to mirror his actions and his personality amongst us. May Allah rest his soul in peace and uh, give us strength and comfort to live and continue his legacy. Shukran. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just read something uh, from uh, Abdul Salam uh, from Lagos and I want to say thank you very much to every, for the people who have tuned in and they're watching us via the YouTube channel. Uh, we know that you're with us. And um, he says, you are a person everyone wanted to reckon with. You were so beautiful inside out. Death snatched you from us uh, helplessly. I remember my first day in Nairobi. I sat on his special seat when he walked in. Um, he was like, who is this dude who was sat? Who, who, who is on my seat? And I said, it's a dude from Nigeria. He kicked me in a funny way and said something in Swahili. And I asked him what he said. He said... Um, he just said, he said, Asante, and then he laughed. <laughs> we all know that is a lie. I can't remember what he said. Goodbye, dear friend. Goodbye, my mentor, Abdul Salam from BBC Abuja. Let's have Yvonne. Good afternoon. I am Yvonne Mwasia. I met Sam uh -uh, when I joined the BBC three months later. Had made an error on this on the on our shared drive where I had deleted something, and I thought it is something I can just retrieve from the recycled bin. And without knowing, I in a way made him look bad and it was so hard on me and I had to apologize like 10 times and then he would just walk away and leave me there thinking about it and then later on uh, he came 
and was like um um where do you come from <laughs> and i told them I, I told him i come from wingi and immediately he started calling me wakwito and some and i was overprotective he started calling me her younger sister and as much as so many people have said how he loved Luo life and all that, he never appreciated Luo men hanging around his camera <laughs> sisters. And we could fight so much with Sam because he would call me from, even at night he would call me and ask me, where are you? Are you with someone? And I'll say, what are you suggesting, Sam? And then we would talk Kamba and I remember even my close for colleagues and friends um, at work really were concerned. Even my boss, Brenda, at some point, she was concerned that we speak so much Kamba at that corner. And we kept saying that uh, they are jealous of us. And so ours wasn't uh, like talking about work. He loved Kamba jokes and Kamba memes, and we used to speak a lot. And then there's this time that I really wanted to know that, to prove that Sam's, Sam came from Mwingi. And so I went home, bought our traditional tobacco. Uh, we call it Kiraiko, and Sam came all those of us know, um, know that. And when I brought it to him, he looked at me. So he had this behavior of uh, thinking about something later, and then he'd call you. And so he looked at me and he told me, you're totally messed up more than, <laughs> more than myself. Like, I can't smoke this shit. Uh, and he was like, do you play chess? And I said, yes. And he was like, this is like asking me to play against a grandmaster. <laughs> and then over and over, we talked about how, how our relatives or our families and in our tradition, they smoke the tobacco and they are sober all the time. And you couldn't smoke it. And then um, during COVID, things happen. And having in my position, I had, he really trusted me with his struggles that he was going through. And we were working on solutions. We worked together for a long time, and we were. We had options, and somehow I didn't know. Sometimes when you're, when you're supporting someone, you lose track on when it got so serious because some would be serious now, uh, and then you'd joke about the same thing in the next few minutes. And right now, I still struggle in like, I'm trying to figure out where exactly I should have done something, how, who I should have contacted. There's so much going on right now in my head or what exactly I should have done. And, and Sam was a very smart guy and, and probably um, whatever happened should have been the last thing for all the brain that he had, all the solutions he had, and I just, I just, I'm just so sad at the moment, and I feel somehow the same way we on earth um, feel the presence of those of us that have left us. I just hope that he feels the love, he feels somehow, wherever he is, that we still support him, and up until I get clarity of thoughts, I, I, I really, I am struggling to understand what ex exactly as someone do who he really talked and allowed me because it was really hard for some, even though he was telling you like some stuff, it was really hard for some to open up about himself and what he was going through. And so I pray that somehow we find peace
in knowing that we had a good time with Sam and he still somehow, his knowledge is still with us and he's still somehow looking at us and wondering what are you guys doing or what is wrong with your computer or I just pray that at some stage I get sort of a form of closure or um, a feeling that I did something but until then I pray for God's grace to work with me because we have to wake up every day and still live a life of seeing some seeing him talking kamba along sharing kamba memes and all that and i pray that uh, we walk out of here knowing that some really appreciated everybody who checked on him even though because of his pride as well he was so proud, and I, I still remember one time he made me buy a very expensive shoes and he told me, you're not my girlfriend, so I can't spend my money on you. And then he walked me to a very expensive shop and he told me, you have to buy this shoe and you're going to wear it and you're going to buy it. The BBC pays you enough to take care of yourself. And so those are the memories that I will live with and may his soul rest in peace. Um, as we almost draw to a close, I'd like to invite family members. Um, Mama Helen, would like to invite you all. Come on, you have something small to say. Um, Eunice Kefa, thank you for giving us Sam. And we also want to welcome you here to just tell us about your son, your brother, your cousin, Karibuni. life and laughter. Sam was reliable and responsible and always made sure that I was well taken care of. I thank Jehovah for giving me such a wonderful loving son and loving son and I will always treasure and remember him in my heart. Asante Nisan. and Kefa. Of the prestige of being associated with an international organization. 
perhaps that contributed to him being a very articulate English speaker, the Queen's language. Sam was also a perfectionist, an articulate person, wanting everything done in the best possible way and pursuing the finer things in life. In the last few months, we would talk with him for long hours, sometimes in the morning and evening as well, as we shared on the challenges we are facing. I felt even closer to him and would enjoy these moments. I was the first to discover that he was no more, and I really want him, and I still do. I will really miss him. Rest well, my brother, my friend. Thank you. I'd like to take uh, this uh, opportunity on behalf of my mother, my sister, my niece, my granddaughter, extended family, to thank you so very much. Um, we've discovered that Sam not only had an immediate family, but a very big, big family. And we really treasure your kind thoughts, kind actions, and your thoughtfulness. Thank you so much. So this is my tribute. Our creator, Jehovah God, loves diversity. It can be seen all around us, and it is also very visible in our immediate family. Some loved adventure, spontaneity. I loved the known and tried. He could tinkle with electronics, and I would not touch them. We had different opinions, tastes, and preferences. With time, I have come to appreciate how valuable the gift of free will is, and that ultimately, diversity is not a constraint, but it in fact enriches our lives. Ultimately, this is what makes up a person, our inclinations, talents, and choices. During this difficult period, I have taken great comfort in these Bible verses. This is found in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. I'll read, it's quoted. Whatever prayer, whatever request for favor may be made by any man or by all your people, Israel, for each one knows the plague of his own heart. When they spread out their hands toward this house, then may you hear from the heavens your dwelling place, and may you forgive and take action and reward each one according to all his ways. For you know his heart. You alone truly know every human heart. The next quotation is from the book of Job, chapter 14 and verses 14 and 15. If a man dies, can he live again? I will wait all the days of my compulsory service until my relief comes. You will call, and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite Sam's niece, and I'd also ask um, the cousins, who's, who's, whoever's also reading for the cousins, to, to get ready. Thank you. Hello, my name is Faith Maluki, and uh, I'm here with my beautiful niece. She'll say hi. Hi, I'm Michelle Sam's niece. Yes. Thank you. So I'll read her tribute. It is with deepest sorrow and sadness that I write this tribute to you, you an uncle in a million. My uncle was an extremely loving and caring son, brother, uncle, and grandfather and friend. The world has truly lost a great man. Though most times he could not be there physically, he will do always do his best to make sure he knew how I was faring by calling, texting, and even sending me photos of the different destinations he visited worldwide. 
Uncle Sam will forever remain an award-winning uncle. He did so much for me. He even chose my name after I was born. My mom wanted to name me Barbara, but he convinced her that Michelle was better, and I like Michelle. He bought me my first laptop and taught me how to use it. He would always make time to talk to me over the phone, and we had so many meaningful and meaningless conversations of exchange recipes. Yeah, and they even exchanged lots of recipes. I will never forget how scared I was to tell him that I was expectant. I thought he would be disappointed because the timing was not exactly perfect. But to my surprise, he was overjoyed and proud that he would soon be a grandfather. He spoiled my daughter Natalie with gifts every time they met, and he would always do something for her on her birthday. He was such a selfless man who touched so many lives. He would listen to everyone's problems and try to offer solutions to them. His friends, colleagues, and family could always count on him. Unfortunately, death suddenly snatched you away from me. This all feels like a nightmare to me, and I vividly remember when my mom called to say that you are no more. It is so heartbreaking that you didn't give me a chance to say goodbye or just to hear how you picked my calls with your accent. Hi, Michelle, you will always say. I feel like I never told you how much I love and appreciate you. Your death has come as a rude shock. No one expected it. And we are all wishing we had more time with you, but God in his infinite wisdom knows best. May our Lord comfort us and keep you safe resting in perfect peace. You will forever be missed and forever loved. Till we meet again. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, all. Uh, on behalf of the cousins, and I will ask the cousins that are here, please, you can just stand by. If you can do that quickly. You can just stand, maybe in front, uh, as a show of solidarity. Thank you. Um, it's very hard to describe some as a cousin after many of us have talked from the family, colleagues, friends, and such. Um, our tribute as it's been written again, uh, several of it has, the family has said some was named after our grandfather the father to our mother, or to his mother, or that is Ellen. And uh, the late Samson Kalundu was just some that probably most of you experienced by way of neatness. Uh, I knew him the time um, almost before the gentleman went to be with the Lord then, but he was dumb, neat, and that is some for you. So, uh, Samson Kalundukeni was named after our grandfather, the late Samson Kalundu, who most of us, if not all of us, remember him for his serious, again, something that was with some serious wit or jokes, or can say serious jokes. A character you will quickly see in Sam's life all through, uh, he will be serious even when joking, and he will be uh, a very good person and a cheer person to be with along. Sam, Sam like his late namesake, liked finding things. And I think this has been, I mean, been said here over and over. I even heard there was Chinese cabbage when, which some knew how to make. <laughs> uh, from food, dressing, our grandfather would not stand, uh, what do you call it, like my bottom of the 
uh, what do you call it uh, the, the trosa is supposed to, was supposed to be of course he was a policeman i think something like that but him is either it's folded very nicely so that you can't see in ringo so that's that's kind of some and i think that's why probably you would have the shots if the <laughs> if the trossers would have something like that so actually some uh, liked living in that fast lane and that is true for us who have known him um, not to mention his fine spoken english i had a chance to uh, have him in my school when i was a, a class behind we are more or less agement is just ahead with some months and uh, uh, of course when he came in because he was coming from nairobi i was down chags and uh, he was quickly uh, put in the uh, what do you call it the, the debate club and uh, it was just an easy game this must have given him an edge uh, to join bbc and i think i got that one from the gentleman who uh, gave the testimony of the colleague who when he was being uh, onboarded and work at the bbc for years to his demos where he has been housed in this one we have no doubt some was undoubtedly very generous very resourceful very helpful as most of you have said to his family in the immediate form and even to the extended in our cousins group which i normally um coordinating uh, when we have events just like we had just like the other day and that is the only one probably that he did not uh, manage even attending or giving and i guess because we talked on friday before uh, a week before and uh, of course he would call me mano so he, he still said mano how have you been and we chatted a little bit and he said how would deal but never to talk again until uh, our sister called me among the past people to attend to that call after he was no more very awful and who contribute most of the cousins nieces because of his nature of work probably some of us some of them he had not met but he would participate even over and above any other person who was in that group um, something that was and has been said here and that probably would be because of his nature of working away uh, he would do his part quickly having been born and raised in Nairobi the bright or brilliant sum and that is a characteristic that probably the men that have been called Samson Kalundu I have a few here the man who read the eulogy uh, my brother who is elder either they are engineers or scientists most of them in our family and i think that is something that is i probably we can see so having been brought um, and born, born and brought up in nairobi sam was i mean and mustard even mother tank just a few strikes a uh, stretch that he had in uh, when he was doing his studies uh, in the high school at the high school level in uh, Mwingio in his uh, home place and that is what he would engage us all through not the language of Nairobi or even any other or even the English that he would he would engage us and that like myself I think we rarely when we bumped one another even uh, a, a few it's very coincidental that the last two meetings we had myself and him were the last one in Dar es Salaam when I was jetting in I mean back here and then he was just coming in and said Mano uh, where you got to go and something I mean like what are you doing here and such and we engaged and left him apparently again we bumped when I was off to Mombasa and then he is again in JK going somewhere so some similarly uh, that is something that he really because he quite grasped and he grasps those words that uh, some of you mentioned here ah uh, 
Yes, as my colleagues and cousins were saying, the space here would limit and time because we have much we can say all of us as a cousin to Sam who was a great person to us and a good brother to us. We sincerely will miss Sam. Rest in peace, our cousin. God bless all of you. Thank you. All right. We've come to the end of uh, this memorial service. Um, I just want to say something uh, before we finish up. For me and uh, Faith, uh, I would call them the three musketeers. One of them was called Mr. Universe. Mr. Universe is Anthony. Because this guy comes with no food and believes that he will eat. <laughs> I don't know how that works. So Universe conspires to give him lunch. So that's why he ended up being called Mr. Universe. And then of course there was a beautiful uh, Faith, and then now Sam. And this is very weird. Me and Faith, we used to call him Beth. I know, yeah. And so when I, um, he, you know, in the recent past he's been on and off the office, so whenever I would walk in uh, into the studio, I mean, it's just a few blocks, a few steps away from him. If I don't see him, then I, and probably Faith is in there, so I'd knock and force to want to get in, okay? They have a card thing that you have to activate. And of course we don't have, it's only the engineers who can activate the room, all right? So I'd ask Faith, and where is Beth? And Faith would say, why don't we call him? And then I would go with those ones. If I call him with my phone, not because I don't have credit, eh? but if I use my phone, he will not pick up because he knows So what we we'll would do is we we'll would use Faith's number, Faith's uh, mobile phone, because immediately he saw any engineer calling him. I tell you, Sam would pick it like, like yesterday. And so he would pick Faith's uh, you know, call, and then only to find my, my voice there. Niaji Sam. Utewai wacha ujinga. And um, the other day we were just reminiscing and saying, Yani, we will not be calling Bib anymore. But uh, I want to leave you with, uh, with a scripture in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. I think I read it during the service. If you would kindly indulge me before we finish. Ask your neighbor, what's the time? Ask your other neighbor, what's the time? 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 What did they tell you? The, huh? They don't know. All right. So Ecclesiastes says, there's a time for everything. A season for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and build and a time to build a time to weep and a time to laugh a time to mourn and a time to dance a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to search and a time to grow up a time to keep and a time to throw away a time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. I don't know what that time is. A time to war and a time for peace. This was a time for some to say goodbye to us. And so everyone here, I, I pray that you will find it in your hearts to also say bye-bye to him because it was his time. Kevin. Thank you all for being with us this morning as we remember and celebrate Sam. Strength and grace and peace to you all. I will close with um, the blessing that I read at the beginning. And please take courage and strength in this. May the sun bring you energy every day, bringing light into the darkness of your soul. May the moon softly restore you by light 
bathing you in the glow of restful sleep and peaceful dreams. May the rain wash away your worries and cleanse the, the hurt that sits in your heart. May the breeze blow new strength into your, into your being and may you believe in the courage of yourself. May you walk gently through the world, keeping Sam with you always, knowing that he will always be part of your beating heart. Asante. All right. Kindly, we have, we have uh, tea and uh, snacks that have been prepared for all of us. And so you will find a tent uh, right behind there, and that will be uh, good. Uh, let's have Samuel Morunga. Samuel, please. A vote of thanks and a closing prayer. Hi, good, good afternoon again. Um, it's good to see you all, and um, thank you so much for staying through the whole memorial service. Uh, before I say the last words, I've been requested to ask um, Dennis uh, if you could please come and give us an update on the, um, the next steps with the burial plants. Uh, thank you, Namurunga. Um, First, allow me to just uh, ask the people from the family and friends that came to just just stand up. The people that came with the family of Sam Kenny, other than the family. Uh, yeah, that Sam's um, family uh, and friends that accompanied them uh, to this uh, service. And thank you very much from our hand we can have a visit. From our hand as a family, we really appreciate you uh, for what I have always said since when I stepped into your talkings, because you have demonstrated a family other than a workplace uh, to us as Sam's part of the family. And thank you so, so much, BBC family, all across. Um, yes, on behalf of the family, um, I think there was knowledge that uh, we will have this service today and follow up immediately tomorrow uh, with the barrio. Uh, uh, that due, due to consultations within the family, it was failed uh, that was uh, not possible to be there and that actually was communicated yesterday. Um, because as a Friday, there were a few consultations that were there, and then they felt they had a meeting yesterday, and they said um, the family at home and the family uh, down here in Mwingi and the family down in Nairobi have a common one-on-one. Um, -on -one. And from the meeting that was there, it was said, probably by close of today or close of tomorrow, we will get the new date, which will be communicated to all of you. Uh, we have your liaison team, and uh, again, we actually thank you for being there for the family. I think every day we have had a couple, or if not most of you, around. I think I am now uh, able to know most of you, some of them that I knew as I was teasing them that were there. I only knew a few names, like, I don't know why they have big names. You know, Salim Kikeke, <laughs> Jamuri Mapiombo, <laughs> Rambo. Anyway, yeah, so that is where we were, uh, with due respect. So allow the family to communicate to us, all of us, probably as it has been uh, changed. So we really appreciate your work, and we look forward to walking the le I mean the left part of the journey which is very little uh, into laying the remains of our late brother and colleague God bless you and thank you Asante very much. Um, thank you thank you Dennis right um, the last four hours have gone by very quickly um, which is testament to just um, the beauty of this memorial service and who some meant to all of us 
And I want to start by taking a moment, first and foremost, to thank Sam's family for giving us this opportunity to honor him and to pay tribute to who he was to us as a colleague, as a friend, as a brother to many here. And so we say, Asanteni Sana. Um, please, I don't know, you, you know, usually people, we go to political rallies and other um, mundane things. People clap for, you know, everything that people say, but I'll, I'll request us humbly just for this one moment. It's a somber moment, but if we could put together our hands to appreciate the family for making it possible for us to do this. Santeni, thank you very much for um, allowing us to do this again. I also want to take a moment to um, appreciate our colleagues who traveled from far, starting with Bruce, Dami, and Mark, and others who might be here. You've come a long way um, from out of the country just to be with us for this moment. We thank you for coming. I want to thank uh, the BBC colleagues, the team who um, have burned the midnight oil, um, staying overnight. Uh, we've had guys who did um, an official works here just to make sure that um, all the plans were in place so that we could have this moment. But beyond that, to support the family, those of um, us who've been to the home in um, Great Wall and who have reached out to the family and friends in other ways also. Thank you so much for doing that. I also want to say thank you to colleagues and friends um, who are here. You might not have spoken, but you've shared your message, whether it's on the Kudo board, on the WhatsApp group, and in any other way, um, just so that you could um, remember some or also reach out to others who are hurting in this moment to comfort them. Thank you for doing that. Um, also, um, lastly, but in no way least, um, Sam's team, uh, you've all been here for many days, but also for today. It's been a seamless production. I, I, I put that in quotes, but it's gone great. And thank you so much for making it possible. We appreciate you. And we also appreciate the events team. As um, Ken and Martin said, we have a tent right outside um, in, in front of me or behind you. We have some refreshments. Please, um, if you have a moment before you rush out, get something to re-energize yourself for the journey. Um, we have washrooms on my right. There's a gent. The first one is a gent. And then I think there's another one for the ladies um, if you need to um, then visit those as well. I want to finish by um, saying that, as, as Dennis has said, it's the journey is ongoing, but we are, we are coming close with um, Sam's last journey. Let's stay with the family. Let's, let's keep on supporting them. Let's keep on supporting Sam's friends, colleagues who work with him closely, but also the rest of us as a big BBC family. Let's continue supporting each other um, and stand with, with, um, with the family to the end. Um, I will say, I'll, if you allow me, we'll say a prayer, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be free to have some refreshments and live at our pleasure. Thank you. Um, let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this afternoon. We are grateful for this moment that we've had to honor our colleague Sam, um, who's um, a son, sibling, um, uncle, um, grandparent, father, um, to some within the family, but generally to all of us as a friend and a colleague, and we thank you for this moment. We thank you that everything has gone well. We commit what is remaining, um, the last bit of his final journey into your hands. We pray that you'll be with the family you strengthen and comfort them, you'll provide everything that is needed, that you'll give us the strength, the resilience to see to the end. We pray that even as we live here, you'll go with each of us, you'll grant us strength and grace, um, and you'll keep us safe until we see each other again. In the almighty name of God, we pray and believe. Amen. Santeni. KCR uh, 498Z, kindly go ahead and uh, repack, please. KCR 498Z, should I say the model? No, 